Good morning. The Bermondsey by-election. They're counting there now, and it seems there may be a turnout rivaling that at the general election, when it was 59%. But, of course, there are 16 candidates in this by-election. They've got to cope with them, so we're not expecting the result for a wee while yet. Bermondsey. Hardly anyone, until about two weeks ago, thought that it was likely to be a name to live in the history of the Labour Party. It looked just like another by-election in a safe, if decaying, Labour seat. But if the signs tonight are right, then Bermondsey will be a name at the centre of the next fight to control the Labour Party. So tonight we will hear from Mr Neil Kinnock for Labour, from Mr Clement Freud for the Liberals. Mr Freud is a man who knows how to win by-elections himself. And from Mr Cecil Parkinson, the Conservative Party chairman, who may lose a deposit tonight, but may see enough to satisfy himself he can win a general election. Well, now down at the count, Peter Sissons. Peter. Alistair, about 20 minutes ago, there was a remarkable sight here. The Liberal Alliance candidate, Simon Hughes, the 31-year-old barrister, stood with his hands in the air in triumph as the Fleet Street photographers took their pictures for the first edition of this morning's newspapers. That is how confident the Alliance are that they have won this rock-solid Labour seat tonight. And Mr Hughes was followed a few moments later by a disconsolate Peter Tatchell, still keeping his chin up, but clearly in no mood to raise his hands above his head. So if that is the outcome, and the party professionals here, basing their judgment on their own instincts and their canvassing returns are simply arguing about the size of the majority. Some put it at 1,500, some put it at 2,000, and one even put it at 9,000. If that is the outcome, then it is clear a political sensation on the scale of Mrs Shirley Williams's victory at Crosby. The difference this time, of course, is that for the first time, the Alliance would have taken a Labour seat, and uh, a solid one at that. Well, one of the difficulties that we can't be certain when we'll get the exact declaration, as you yourself said earlier, is the, uh, the latest entry in the Guinness Book of Records, the ballot paper here, which is more than 15 inches long, which has 16 names on it. Uh, the previous record was 12. Uh, there are two Hugheses, the Liberal Alliance candidate, Simon Hughes, at number nine, the Conservative candidate, Robert Hughes, at number eight. The word Labour appears on it four times. We're getting uh, a word from the returning officer. Let's just listen. I think we're getting the turnout. The turnout today has been 57.7%. Thank you. So the turnout, 57.7%, is less than that in the general election of 1979, when it was 59.3%. But it's come within uh, a whisker of the general election turnout, and for a by-election, that must be adjudged a very good turnout indeed. Remember, in Peckham, uh, nearby Peckham, uh, Labour did hold the seat there on something like a 38% turnout. But let's, let's have another look, can we, at, at, at the ballot paper. It's an interesting uh, document. And again, one of the reasons that uh, the sorting and the counting down there is going to take that little bit of extra time as I said, the word uh, Labour appears there four times. There's an independent Labour, there's a Labour, there's a Bermondsey real Labour. Uh, there's uh, two communists, there's a revolutionary communist and a communist. Uh, and all that makes for a great deal of painstaking paperwork. But none of it changes the fact that here tonight in Bermondsey, we're in for another result which is going to shake the political foundations a little bit more and will give everyone that much more to think about in what could be election year. We'll be back if there is a any movement at all on the, on the counting side. But, of course, the only poll that matters is the one they're counting now. Nonetheless, earlier today, we spoke to voters as they left the polling stations. This was a totally random selection, but ITN's Gary Mitchell found strong evidence of a late loss of support for Peter Tatchell, with the Liberal Alliance candidate Simon Hughes picking up those votes. The Labour Party here have known all along that their biggest problem was to get the traditional Labour supporter to turn out and vote for a new and controversial candidate like Peter Tatchell. The opinion polls suggest that support for Mr Tatchell has been drifting away and that the Liberal, Simon Hughes, has a real chance of winning a seat that's been solidly Labour for 60 years. And at polling stations tonight, there was some evidence that people who had voted Labour in the past were not doing so this time. 
Simon Hughes. Can you tell me why? Yes, because I think he's a sincere man. Um, I've always uh, been a Labour man before, but I think he's a sincere man. And I think it's about time that Bermondsey, because we have been disillusioned by Labour for so long, that we should now have a change. And I hope this man does something. Do you normally vote Liberal? No, Labour. Well, why have you changed this time? Well, I think uh, Michael Foote is a bit too old uh, to be in the Labour Party now. And he should re resign, like, and let a younger man take over. D did you always vote Liberal? Or is this a change? Uh, no, it's the first time. Yeah. So yeah. You, what have you changed from? From Labour. Yeah. So what, what, why did you do <coughs> it this time? Because, you know, I just uh, think the, the Liberals are, uh, you know, doing a bit uh, better than any other parties. Last time I voted, I voted it's Conservative, but uh, I don't know, I think it's the Liberals this time. Do you think he's going to win? I hope so. Actually. Can you tell me why? Um, yes, yeah, Labour for the area. I've always voted Labour throughout my life. I support him, really. Yeah, but you didn't feel divided loyalties this time? Uh, Grady and not, not Grady, no. Mm. Uh, Grady can stick to the local politics in that sense. He's the council man. I'll stick to touch up for Parliament. I voted Labour because my father and mother and the whole of my family, all their lives, voted Labour. And I'm 88 years of age. The faces and voices of Bermondsey coming from the polls today. But Mr Kinnock, we don't pretend to know what the precise result is. It does seem that Labour has lost. Why? Oh, it's very straightforward. Uh, that uh, the whole of the forces ranged against Labour have all fallen in behind Simon Hughes for tactical purposes. I've no doubt that Mr Hughes will have a, a short sojourn in Parliament and be out at the general election. But this is tactical voting on a pretty substantial scale and it's taking place. And once the voters of Bermondsey or a, a substantial chunk of them realized that they could accomplish the end of defeating Peter Tatchell by falling in behind the Liberal candidate, uh, then that is the way in which uh, things have been moving and I think that's probably going to be the result that we see tonight. Uh, Mr Freud, he says your man won't stay there long. Why should he stay there long? Why should he hold the seat at a general election? They elected him. He's a super candidate. But I would just like to say, and he had the right message above all, because British people vote for the right message, it is very odd that if people don't vote for you, it's tactical. And if people vote for you, it's because we are terrific chaps. We're going to hear a lot of that tonight. It's all tactical, you know, because they voted for the man who had the right message. Um, I think it was a dirty campaign, and we fought it clean. Um, we had the best candidate. Mr Parkinson said that his man would get 25% of the vote, which means that everybody else would have lost their deposit. It would be interesting to see. Well, Mr Parkinson, do you repent of having made that forecast? No, actually, what I said at the time, I stated a set of facts, but Clement's never been very good with facts, so I just repeat them for his benefit so he picks them up again. I just stated that we won 24.9% of the poll at the last election. Uh, that we had a lead in the national polls at the moment uh, of between 15 and 11 percent, and that the Labour Party seemed hell-bent on pouring petrol over itself and striking a match. Mr. Grady and Mr. Tatchell uh, deliberately uh, slanging each other, certainly Mr. Grady attacking Mr. Tatchell very, very viciously indeed, and trying to prove to the electorate that neither of them was suitable to be the Labour member, and I said, if anybody uh, could come through the middle, we could. It was a perfectly feasible possibility. I think we've been squeezed, uh, and uh, I'll be pleased to serve our deposit. But at the time I made that remark, we, I just stated a set of facts. Well, now, the set of facts. You came second in the general election, yes. and therefore would be the natural challengers to the yeah. Labour Party in other circumstances. You're so far ahead in the national opinion polls that everybody says Mrs. Thatcher is almost an automatic re-election at, at a general election. Why did you fail in Bermondsey? Why are you worried about your deposit now? I think the principal reason was that uh, people came to the conclusion that we wouldn't win, that the traditional Labour voter who was being advised by the two Labour candidates that neither of them was suitable to represent the constituency finds it a very big step to step from Labour over to Conservative. And we've seen this over and over again, uh, that the Liberal Party is seen as a sort of electoral waiting room. You can step into it, 
because you want to detach yourself from your traditional party. And in due course, you step out of it. You didn't know why you joined them. You feel no regret at leaving them. But for the time, it's convenient to have a protest place to go. And if you want to protest and you believe in grumble politics, and by the way, I don't know what this message of Mr. Hughes was. As far as I can see, he never mentioned policies at all. Um, he just kept off policies because he knows what he stands for wouldn't appeal to Bermondsey. Uh, then uh, I think they're a convenient clearinghouse. People will stay there for a short time and then go back to their traditional home. All right, well, we've had the tactics and we've had the first explanations. We'll have time to go into some of those matters in a moment. But if Labour really has lost Bermondsey, it won't exactly be the first time that it has lost a poor inner city seat. For example, it lost Edge Hill in Liverpool just before the last general election, the swing there about 32% to the Liberals. And that was, in one sense at least, a pointer to the Labour Party's forthcoming defeat. But in Bermondsey, as we've heard, it's been a campaign in which Labour has been at loggerheads with itself, and also therefore a campaign in which Mr Foote's own leadership has been remorselessly dragged in. A report by our political editor, Glyn Mathias. It was Bob Mellish who made this by-election necessary, resigning as MP to force a showdown with Peter Tatchell. With friends like John O'Grady, leader of Southwark Council for 14 years, he dominated the local Labour Party. Then the left took control and he couldn't stomach it. Uh, I, I lean it with regret because I've hurt people like Michael Foote and other decent people. But this shower in Bermondsey, I can't, I'm not a bit sorry about that. It does hurt, Mr Mellish, doesn't, doesn't it? Hurt. How much? A lot. You can't, you can't be in something for 50 odd years. The party leader, Michael Foote, had 14 months ago disowned Peter Tatchell, announcing to the House of Commons that he would never be endorsed as an official Labour candidate. Uh, the individual concerned is not an endorsed member. <laughs> The individual, the individual concerned is not an endorsed member of the Labour Party and as so far as I'm concerned never will be an endorsed member. But he'd picked difficult ground on which to fight. The local Labour Party stood their ground and insisted on reselecting Peter Tatchell. Mr Foote changed his mind and earlier this week went out of his way to demonstrate his backing for his candidate. He denounced what he called the smears and scares used by Labour's opponents. If I had not been determined to come down in any, any way, I would have come down to stand on the same platform with Peter Tatchell and repudiate those attacks upon him in this room. It has indeed been a rough campaign for Mr Tatchell. He came to Britain from Australia 12 years ago because he refused to fight in the Vietnam War. But it was Mr Foote's action in disowning him which shot Mr Tatchell to national prominence. His left-wing views and his support for gay rights brought him constant controversy. Peter Tatchell speaking, the Labour candidate for Southwark and Bermondsey. You know I live on the Rockingham estate by the Elephant and Castle. I live in this constituency. I live in a council flat and I'm not going to move away and buy a big posh house in Chelsea once I'm elected. Initially it seemed that John O'Grady, champion of the old-style right-wing Labour Party in Bermondsey, would be Mr Tatchell's main challenger. He said that local people just didn't want Peter Tatchell to represent them and a lot of the personal abuse came from his camp. He said he was offering the people a choice. I'm, I'm standing as what I call real Labour, i.e. the traditional Labour Party that uh, the people locally understand. Peter Tatchell is the official Labour candidate, and I don't think he is suitable for Bermondsey at all. But during the campaign, the Liberal Simon Hughes emerged as the candidate likely to collect the most anti-Tatchell votes. As the O'Grady campaign faded, the Alliance bandwagon got moving, boosted by an opinion poll which showed they were catching up. The 31-year-old barrister found himself running neck and neck with Labour. We have continued to make deep inroads into our opponent's support, and many who were doubtful are coming over to us. I'm beginning to sense that we're pushing at a door that uh, the electorate are wanting to open for us. The Conservative Robert Hughes was also trying to pick up anti tatchell votes. He worked hard in unpromising territory, but it looked as if he was being squeezed between the other candidates. Altogether, it's been a raucous and dirty campaign, 
At times, the people of Bermondsey have been deafened by the rival slogans. But the voters have been taking notice, and what at the outset looked like an almost certain Labour victory turned into a surprisingly close contest. Well, with me at the Bermondsey count is the Liberal Alliance candidate Simon Hughes. Mr Hughes, have you won? It looks like it, Peter. You're claiming victory. I won't claim it till I hear the Mayor announce the result, but it looks pretty certain. And on what do you base that? It's two things. It's a gradual build-up of our support over several years, and it's a decision by the people of Southwark and Bermondsey that they wanted a change and they were going to be sure they had one. And what of your canvassing, your last-minute returns, your, the, the, what your party professionals are telling you? What, what, what sort of majority are you going to get? It's difficult. I wasn't here earlier in the evening, so I haven't been looking and seeing what's been going on. But I would think that it may be that we will manage to get over 50% of the votes. Are you talking of a, a five-figure majority? I think that might be a bit optimistic, but it's certainly going to be more than four figures. Now, what of those who say that this is a freak result could never possibly be repeated at a general election? I think that it's exactly the opposite to that. I think it's a result that shows that people, when they have the opportunity, can realise that liberalism and the new politics is relevant in the inner city because the old politics has failed. Well, you've just said that by approaching, say, 50% of the vote, you could beat a united Labour Party. Do you really believe that in this constituency? I think that's quite clear. I think that's quite clear. I think it will be clear that we've beaten the combination of the four Labour candidates' votes. It may be that we have beaten the vote of all the other candidates as well. And I don't think it would have mattered who was the candidate. But again, can I put to you that the, the, the Labour alibi, one should imagine, will be that this was such a, a distinctively different and bizarre sort of campaign with heavy media involvement, Fleet Street uh, campaign practically non-stop against the Labour yes. candidate, yes. that this result could not be repeated at a general election. It's been repeated before. Liberals have won seats from Labour in inner city areas. Edge Hill was the last one, overturning a large Labour majority. I see no reason why it can't be repeated again. The great thing is that if we win, it's the Alliance's first victory from Labour, and it puts us on the road to great things. How much do you think the personality, the all of the smears and that sort of thing directed against Peter Tatchell affected the result? I don't know, and I can't estimate that. It might have had an effect. I would think it probably did have an effect. I'm happy to say we have never been involved in any of that. We have fought our campaign in the same way back from two or three years ago when... Your channel kindly said that I'd won the GLC election results for 20 minutes until the computer corrected it. But uh, since then we've gone on, building up support in the community, and I don't think at the end of the day the personalities were the overriding factor. Do you think Peter Tetchell had a raw deal from the campaign? I think he had a raw deal from the press. I think he had a raw deal from some of the other opponents of his, not us. I think some of the other candidates had a raw deal from him, and there was some mudslinging which uh, didn't help the campaign at all and the politicians who've been singing the mud might have learnt their lesson now. Simon Hughes, you've claimed victory. The man you claim to have defeated is standing behind you talking to Glyn Mathias. Thank you, Glyn. Well, Peter Tatchell, uh, the Liberals are claiming victory. Do you concede defeat? Not yet. We'll wait to the result. But it does look as if it's going very heavily against you. Well, it's been expected in the last couple of days because we have witnessed an unprecedented campaign in terms of dirt and smear. I don't think there's ever been a candidate in my memory who's had to weather 15 months, because that's when the by-election started, 15 months ago. And we've had a non-stop campaign in the media and whispering on the doorsteps, a really disgraceful campaign of smears uh, against myself and the Labour Party, and it looks as though it has taken its toll. And I think that's a tragedy, not for me, but for politics in general, because I think the Labour Party in this election, uh, whatever the result, we've fought this election in a very honest and open way. And we've fought on policies, not on personalities or personal abuse. We haven't lied or smeared our opponents. We've just fought on policies. And if we lose, we've lost with honour. And I'm proud to say that. But one of the reasons you became the subject of public attention was mm -hmm. because Michael Foote disowned you as a Labour candidate. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what happened, isn't mm -hmm. it? Well, that was something. But the real smears were not so much based on that. They were based on my own personal life. They were based upon all other kinds of allegations about being a member of militant, which I've never been, which the press consistently try and claim that I am. Um, there's been a very, very sustained campaign. You've seen it around the streets of Bermondsey, all those obscene slogans of graffiti everywhere. There's been the notorious traitor leaflet, which was put out uh, during the campaign anonymously. Uh, there's been a whole series of other leaflets and a door-to-door -door campaign 
which has really portrayed Peter Tatchell, not as Peter Tatchell is, or not what Peter Tatchell stands for. But it's not just a question of smears, is it? It's also a question of your left-wing views. You mm. do represent a new breed of left-wing mm. politician in the Labour Party, mm -hmm. and it's that too, isn't it? Well, I don't think that ever got a chance to be heard, because as you know, we've had press conferences for the last three weeks. Every morning we've outlined Labour's positive proposals on different policies. Hardly a word of it was printed anywhere in the newspapers or the media. Hardly a word. It was all based upon tittle-tattle and gossip and sort of silly things, really. Personalities and personalised issues. And I think the electors never had a chance to make up their own mind. They were denied that right by the media. And, and unfortunately, we tried our best in this campaign, but we were not able to counteract 15 months of misrepresentation in the press. Well, I've heard you on the doorsteps myself explaining Labour's policies mm -hmm. uh, about housing, about office blocks, mm -hmm. about a rents freeze, all mm -hmm. these things. I've heard you explaining to the uh, voters on the doorsteps. Yes, but a few minutes talking on the doorsteps can't counteract what people pick up in their daily paper day after day, week in, week out, month after month. Mm -hmm. And that's what we had to counteract a very, very long, sustained campaign, 15 months, um, which is just, we just haven't been able to counteract in this period. Do, to sum up, I mean, do you accept that this is a very serious defeat for the Labour Party? It's, it's a defeat. I mean, it's a very untypical one. I wouldn't, don't think uh, anybody uh, uh, can gain any comfort from what has happened because we've had 16 candidates, the Labour vote has been split. We've, as I said, seen this unprecedented smear campaign, and I don't think it's something which uh, uh, the victors could claim that they would uh, be able to repeat anywhere else. Peter Tushel, thank you very much. Okay. And now back to thank Alistair you. Burnett. Neil Kinnock. It wasn't just misrepresentation by the press, was it, as Mr. Tatchell is saying, say that meant that his original campaign literature was impounded by the Labour Party, that his own first press conference was stopped by the Labour Party. Hmm. Surely part of his trouble is the Labour Party. Well, that that you mentioned was an incidental. I don't think that it related to a, a handful of votes even. It's not the I way you'd like to start a campaign. No, you? sure. I, of course, it isn't the way I'd like to start a campaign, or anybody would like to start a campaign. But in terms of any subscription it made to today's events, it was less than marginal. Um, the exotic kind of campaign conducted against Peter Tatchell over the last 15 months, as he said, I mean, notoriously, the Sun newspaper has printed allegations about uh, Peter Tatchell which proved to be unfounded and were absolutely cruel and unacceptable. Uh, and, of course, if you just keep on throwing that long enough, some of it sticks. The idea that smoke without fire and so on starts to creep up, and what you get is uh, a notoriously uh, inaccurate picture of a person who's standing as a candidate, and even then, in three or four weeks of campaigning, no matter how fervent it is or how many doors are knocked, it's very difficult to contradict what has become part of the basic consciousness. Yes, and even though Simon Hughes, uh, as he says, didn't uh, spread this, and I would accept that the Liberal Party didn't spread it, nevertheless, the Liberals have been beneficiaries of this campaign of innuendo and slander that's built up. And the unfortunate thing is, as far as anyone can find out, that the Liberal has done nothing to contradict it in the course of of the election campaign, even though they didn't uh, apparently do anything to fuel it. Yes, but it isn't just the newspapers. Aren't you being just a little bit coy? It's the former chief Me whip coy. of the Labour Party. It's his yeah. man. It's the man who's led Southwark Council for the Labour Party over many years. Yes. They're the ones who've been campaigning hardest against Mr. Tatton. Yes, and uh, you, one could expect that. I mean, all uh, civil wars are the filthiest wars, and a division in any party is bound to be the filthiest kind of division. And uh, Bob Mellish, um, I've known Bob over the last 12, 13 years, what he has done is totally unforgivable because although he has subscribed a substantial amount of his life to the Labour Party, he can be absolutely certain that the Labour Party has given him a damn sight more than he's given to the party and every single party member could say the same thing. And so what he has done, especially since he gave his word to Michael Foote that he would not provoke a by-election, has been absolutely unforgivable. Mr. Freud, this is a success for the Liberal Party, isn't it? I mean, the SDP didn't do much to help you. It's a success for Mr. Steele. Oh, that's not true. The SDP did a great deal to help us. Uh, it is a substantial alliance success. But I think it is also a total disintegration of the Labour Party. And as you very rightly said, if people didn't like Mr. Tatchell or his politics, they had Mr. O'Grady. And even if they didn't like Mr. O'Grady, they had two other Labour candidates. And if they didn't like 
any of the four Labour candidates. They had the Conservatives, who got 25% of the vote in the last election, with a similar turnout, who have been abandoned quite simply because the people no longer trust this government. Um, Mr Parkinson, who's actually a much nicer man than one would have thought <laughs> from reading the last Conservative script that he read in the last piece that we had here, um, was not the chairman of the Conservative Party when we took Edge Hill from Labour. So when we took two Conservative seats, he said, and I have a newspaper cutting, he said, the Liberals only take votes, or the Alliance only takes votes from the Conservatives. That's what happened today. Well, now we've taken votes both from Labour and from Conservatives. And the answer is quite simply that incidentally we have the best candidate. But we have the best message and we are trusted by people. I do admit that when people are polled by national opinion polls or whatever, they tend to give different results from the way they, they vote. And that's been shown over and over again. There hasn't been an election in which we haven't outperformed the opinion polls. And we outperform them substantially. But we are now the real opposition. It might just as well be recognized. Do you recognize it? No, and I don't think Clement believes that. It's uh, quite clear that uh, this is a most extraordinary by-election. Uh, as, you, as you yourself said, you have the official Labour candidate opposed by a candidate who is supported by the former Labour chief whip and the person who's been the Member of Parliament for nearly 30 years. And he's advising his electors not to support his old party. So you have division in the Labour Party and, of course, that makes an opening for somebody to dash through. And uh, to pretend uh, that this is typical and is the start of some great new movement is just plain nonsense. I would remind Mr. Freud, he mentioned Edge Hill and he mentioned David Alton, but it didn't result in a great swing to the Liberals in the general election only a few weeks later. So hope springs eternal in the Liberal breast. You can't be a Liberal without being an optimist. And I admire people like uh, Mr. Freud, uh, and uh, the way they beaver away and the way they make these grandiose mar remarks like we are the real opposition now. I'll say this to him. In every seat in the country where the official Labour candidate is supported by a Labour candidate supported himself and proposed by the chief whip, you're in with a fighting chance. There's only one chief whip, by the way, ex-chief whip. But are you encouraged by the disintegration, apparently, of the Labour Party, which we've been discussing, and does this mean you think the Prime Minister will have a rush of blood to the head about a general election? No, I don't think that at all. And uh, I don't myself see this as the uh, beginning of the disintegration of the Labour Party. I see this as a very special set of circumstances. Uh, I haven't seen uh, Mr Hughes before tonight. He seems a very pleasant person. Uh, and he's uh, in the middle of this welter of accusations and very, very rough language which uh, uh, Mr O'Grady's been using about the official uh, Labour candidate. He's contrived to look like Mr Clean, which I suspect his, and it looks as if he's done well. If I can just... Well, sorry, yes. yes. Yeah. This uh, point, as if it's a matter of fact about the disintegration of the Labour Party alleged, I agree with Cecil Parkinson about very little and therefore it must be of value when we agree about something. Uh, and I agree with him that the Labour Party is far from disintegrating. You have an extraordinary set of circumstances in Bermondsey, which I think everybody recognises, uh, and pressures in existence and personalities that are unique, and the word is frequently misused, but actually unique to Bermondsey. I don't think that any evidence of disintegration can be made from this particular laboratory down in Bur Bermondsey today. So but I think it would be fair to say that if the Labour candidate is far to the left, as is Mr Tatchell, then the people at large don't trust Labour anymore. No, and they won't even vote for a Labour man who's on the that's right. That's not true either, you see, because apart from the fact that Mr Tatchell has pursued party policy, uh, and it is a radical policy, but I thought you as a radical, Clement, uh, as a professed radical, uh, might not take too much exception to the new ideas and the new pressures that are responding to the new realities. But uh, in any case, 
uh, in the opinion polls and on the streets and in the discussions that take place in and outside by elections. It isn't those policies that people are objecting to. What they've objected to over the last three years, and Cecil Parkinson knows this uh, as, an, uh, as uh, a distinguished apparatchik himself, is it's been the confusion and conflict within the Labour Party that has generated a feeling of ill-being not the policies. Well, anyway, it is going to be the opinion polls, I think, tomorrow morning, who, like the Liberal Party, will claim a victory. Because uh, it does look as if, in the course of the campaign, it was the national opinion poll in the Daily Mail on February the 18th, which gave the Liberals their opportunity, just as it was another opinion poll 20 years ago at Orpington, that gave the Liberals their opportunity against the Conservatives. So one thing the opinion polls do devastatingly is to show those who want to vote against a candidate who's the best person to support if you want to stop your own enemy. So, although Bermondsey has little or nothing to do with the national polls, where the Tories, for the past months, have been running far, far ahead. So Bermondsey, to that extent, may be irrelevant tonight. The Tories are far ahead, and in the national polls, the Liberal Alliance are nowhere. Almost a year ago, the three parties were level nationally in the opinion polls. Labour 33%, Alliance 33 Conservatives 32 in Gallup in the Daily Telegraph at the time of the Hillhead by-election. Then came the Falklands War. The Conservatives took off, stretching their lead to 19% in midsummer. Labour and the Alliance slumped. By the late autumn, with unemployment rising sharply again, Labour was catching up, narrowing the difference to 7% by Christmas. The Alliance was still nowhere. But Labour's own civil war, stimulated by the Bermondsey by-election, has seemed to push Mrs Thatcher higher again, and until the past week, the alliance stayed nowhere. In Bermondsey itself, a national opinion poll for the Mail on Sunday in early January put Thatcher, Labour, well ahead, 47%, Liberal Alliance, 19%, Real Bermondsey Labour, 18 Conservative, 15 almost no contest. But astonishingly, on February the 18th in the Daily Mail, NOP showed Thatcher in trouble, just 34% of those certain to vote. Liberal, 28%, and now plainly the man to vote for if you wanted to stop Tatchell. Real Bermondsey Labour, 24 Conservative, 11 Then, on Tuesday, the difference closed in ORC for Thames Television. Tatchell, 30, Liberal Alliance, 30, Real Bermondsey Labour, 16, and sinking fast, Conservative, 10, and likely to sink more. Mr Foote's leadership, plainly an issue, showed up badly once again in Gallup this month. Is a good leader, 17%. Is not, 72%. Mrs Thatcher's leadership was better, but only by comparison with his. Satisfied, 45%. Dissatisfied, 50%. It was Mr Steele, who, as usual, came out best. Is a good leader, 62%. Is not, 21 It may be what's kept the Liberals ahead of their partners, the SDP. And we'll be having a look at the moment in what Mr Foote does now. Does he stay or go? But Glyn Mathias down at the count of Bermondsey, do you agree that the opinion polls have been essential in the Liberal Party win? Indeed, it was the uh, Daily Mail opinion poll to which you referred last Friday, which many see as the turning point of this campaign. Up to that point, it had seemed that the fight was an es essentially between Peter Tatchell, uh, the official Labour candidate, and John O'Grady, standing as the real Bermondsey Labour candidate. Everybody said it was a Labour constituency, that a Labour man would win, and it was only a question of which Labour man would win. The Liberals say we were all blind, they were really the main challengers all along, but none of the other parties and none of the main observers here have thought that that was the case. Well, now, Glyn, that apart, Mr. Tatchell has said that nobody else took up the policies, the local policies in the by-election. Do you think that uh, that would really have helped him? Well, I think uh, that is something of an exaggeration. He and his canvassers did spend a great deal of time going around the streets, talking to people at their doors, and handing out their literature, just as all the other parties did. It may be that the press aspect didn't concentrate on that, but nevertheless, they were doing the same kind of canvassing and support uh, for their candidate uh, as all the other parties were. And how, what part did Mr Foote himself play when he went into Bermondsey? Do you think that helped Mr Tatchell, or did it merely embarrass Mr Foote himself? I don't think it re really made a great uh, deal of difference. In a sense, it was uh, appalling mistiming. By the time Mr Foote actually arrived last Monday to speak here at a rally, which was very well attended, but to speak at this rally uh, in Bermondsey, it was quite clear that uh, Peter Tatchell was on the slide, that the votes were moving away from him, that people were switching, and that the uh, uh, Liberal campaign was... Was accelerating. Mr. Mr. Foote and, and his speech uh, in this rally did absolutely nothing to stop that process. 
Thank you, Glenn. We'll be back. We hear a little cheering behind you. When it's really purposeful cheering, we'll be back with you. Now, Mr. Kinnock, what does Mr. Foote do now? Does he give way to Mr. Healy? Oh, Mr. Foote is going to stay, and he's going to lead the Labour Party at the next election, and I think win the election with the Labour Party. Um, the essential question that Michael Foote has had to face ever since becoming leader at the end of 1980 is how does he get a substantial proportion of the party wanting to win against the enemy more than they want to do anything else. And for a substantial proportion of that time, a chunk of the Labour Party, not the majority, but a chunk of it, has given the impression that they've been rather more preoccupied by issues that are not of concern to the general electorate than they are with the business of replacing the Conservative government and implementing Labour Party's policies. Now, in those circumstances, a leader of a voluntary movement uh, that doesn't exercise that kind of self-discipline, the will to win, is in a hopeless position because the public generally will consider that if he can't control his party, how can he run the country? The fact of the matter is that in many ways, the power attendant upon being prime minister enables someone to run the country, as it were, a great deal more easily than the powerless leader of a party, a voluntary party in opposition, uh, since there are no effective impositions that can be made on that party to create self-discipline where self-discipline doesn't exist. As the proximity of the election uh, becomes greater, uh, that self-discipline is being restored. The Labour Party is leadable again in a way that it wasn't for substantial periods. Our recovery will be extremely quick. The unfortunate thing is today, for instance, that uh, such is the special nature of this by-election, everybody's already commented on, that that can't attest to these developments in any way. I think that when we see Darlington in a few weeks' time, uh, you will see this factor working significantly, a united Labour Party pre pressing its policies, supporting its leadership, and we will get a by-election result that is more in keeping with what used to be called the norm. But, of course, the norm is something that started to die about two years ago. But now, last weekend, every senior person in the Labour leadership came out behind Mr Foote. Mm. Some people of a more cynical nature than you are might think that that was ominous for Mr Foote mm. and that to suffer a defeat like this after the restlessness inside the party in the past week when they realised that Bermondsey might go, do you think Mr Foote himself might just get fed up? They, oh, it would be absolutely understandable uh, for someone, certainly as someone as human as Mr Foote, to be fed up quite natural, but of course there are other responsibilities that don't permit the luxury of being fed up. And what we saw last weekend was the most extraordinary thing. The Daily Mail at the root of it again in many ways, uh, the, the, the libel is Gazette, um, because the Parliamentary Labour Party meeting last Thursday night, a week tonight, uh, there were some earnest, uh, uh, brief uh, contributions. Uh, expressing worry about the standing of Michael in the opinion polls uh, that week. And suddenly that became inflated into a great issue. Uh, and uh, we understand the mischievous reasons why it was inflated, but uh, I think it took a lot of people in the Labour Party by surprise, which is why the support for Michael by senior figures and by lots of people up and down the movement, the trade unions and so on, was direct, spontaneous, absolute, unsolicited, and I think that they were articulating the view of the Labour Party. There's no uh, contest of Michael Foote's leadership. Uh, people are united behind him, increasingly so as the weeks go on. And I think that we will develop strength as a consequence of that. Do you, Mr Freud, advise Mr Foote to carry on? Do you want him to carry on? I don't think it's up to me to want him to carry on. I was exceedingly suspicious because twice last week he said he was carrying on. And one can only remember Mark Twain, who said, the more they protested their honesty, the faster we counted the teaspoons. Um, I, I'd like to take up what you said about the opinion polls. You, you presumably want the Liberals or the Alliance to say, we owe it all to the opinion polls. Let me try and remind you that opinion polls are actually people. And it was the people who decided, the 25% who had voted Conservative at the general election, that this was a government not to be trusted. And the most obvious thing 
was for them to vote Conservative had they thought it was a good cause. It quite clearly wasn't. And all this stuff about the Liberals, the SDP, the Alliance being a waiting room um, is actually nonsense because um, I won a by-election. I've been in for 10 years. Cyril Smith won a by-election. He's been in for 11 years. Alan Beath won a by-election. He's been in for nine years. Um, David Alton won a by-election. He stayed in. And so will Simon Hughes stay in. And we stay in because, A, we have the right message, B, we don't fling dirt, and C, people trust us. And that is quite clearly more than they do at the moment. And there really is no good explanation. I mean, the opinion poll is a rotten explanation for the fact that people looked at the candidates, made up their minds, and decided to vote as they did. But it sorted out three candidates, all of whom might have had claims to oppose Labour. But, but the Mr. people were mm. sorting them out. It wasn't the opinion polls that sorted them out. It, may have it was the electorate who decided that they would not vote Conservative. Well, Mr Parkinson, it's rumoured that the Conservative Party prefers Mr Foote to Mr Healy as a leader of the Labour Party. Yes, I, I think that's true. I think that uh, Mr Foote is uh, the sort of leader you hope your opponents will have. Uh, and uh, so it's quite true that we do prefer him. Uh, this is I, but I think, I think it is worth remembering uh, that uh, Mr Foote was chosen because he was the compromise candidate. Uh, that if you remove Mr Foote, you have Mr Ben and you have Mr Healy. And you have the war that went on in the Labour Party for quite a long time. And that war, which uh, Mr Foote uh, has to some extent damped out, would break out again if he went. So uh, they know the dangers of removing him. Uh, as I said, uh, I think uh, from our point of view, he's, he's a good leader for the Labour Party. Now we have some candidates uh, now down at the count. Back now to Bermondsey. Well, with me is John O'Grady, who stood as the real Bermondsey Labour candidate. Mr O'Grady, you look as if you've come in a not very good third. Hmm. Well, I'm extremely disappointed, of course, because earlier in the campaign it looked as though I stood a very good chance of winning and uh, retaining the seat for Labour. I think there's been a massive switch of votes. Uh, the expression of the people's wish to keep out the official Labour candidate. And the only way they could do that was desert me and indeed desert all the other candidates and put their money on Hughes. You had some warning, I think, that uh, this was likely to happen. Yes, and uh, I've fought against it and have continuously said at press conferences and on the doorstep, I don't advise anyone to vote Liberal, but one could see the swing starting to move and the opinion polls, um, I think, um, forced people almost into the position of feeling that the only way of keeping out Mr. Tatchell was to vote for Hughes. Now, your supreme objective was to stop Peter Tatchell, and is it acceptable to you uh, that a Liberal has won because of that? It's not acceptable because I don't think the Liberals have won. I think Labour has lost this election. Come a general election with a candidate acceptable to the people of the borough, Labour can win back Bermondsey uh, for Labour. You have, in fact, been making a point about the state of the Labour Party. Mm. What do you think they should now do uh, between now and the general election in Bermondsey? Well, they certainly have to ensure that the views of local people are taken fully into account before putting a candidate before them. And the Labour Party generally has to learn this lesson. And if it fails to do so, it will develop into a rump representing a very small section of the population and will not get the support that would allow it to return to government. I hope they'll learn the lesson, I hope they'll take the action necessary and can get back on the rails. Now, what majority do you think uh, the Liberals are likely to have here tonight? Well, looking at the piles of paper on the table, it looks very much as though uh, the Liberals may be double the official Labour candidate's vote. And that is an expression of the very strong feeling of the people of the area in line with what I have been saying for so long. 
and indeed in line with what I told Mr Foote personally 18 months ago. Tatchell cannot win the seat for Labour. Mr O'Grady, thank you very much. Now over to Peter Sissons. And with me is the Conservative candidate, the other Mr Hughes, Robert Hughes, also 31. He works for the BBC as well. Have you lost your deposit? Uh, well, according to the straw polls, I've been whisked so fast up here, I haven't even had a chance to look at the tables. But it uh, probably looks that way. And that may, that's uh, bad news by any standards not for the Conservatives? All. No, not at all. What's happened uh, just in the last couple of days is that people have been saying to myself and my helpers on the doorsteps, well, we'd love to vote for you, we would vote for you in a general election. In fact, we want to see a Conservative government. But we've really got to stop Labour winning Bermondsey. We, uh, and that is our primary motive in voting today, and we're going to vote for the Liberals to stop them. Do you see the Alliance victory, because that's uh, clearly what we're going to get, a Liberal Alliance victory, as uh, purely the result of tactical voting to get the old Labour Guard out and to stop the new Labour Party taking over? Certainly as far as the people who've uh, decided not to vote for me today, uh, that's the case, certainly. What it is, it's a factor of 50 years of Labour control that, that, that have cr created a devastation in Bermondsey. And people were determined to get rid of it. And that's what they've done today. And why shouldn't that pattern be repeated at a general election in every inner city seat? Which would mean the end for the Tories in the inner cities. I, I, I don't think that would happen because I think they've also used the factor of Tatchell. It's the, it's the particularly local factors. That's what they've voted about. Particularly local factors here. And, and not nationally. Otherwise they wouldn't have been saying to me on the doorsteps that we want to see Margaret Thatcher carry on as Prime Minister. Well, but you never, ever go, were going to be with a chance of winning this seat, were you? Well, if we'd have been able to keep the sort of vote we had last time, of course we would have been, perhaps. And indeed, uh, we were getting, getting a very friendly response on the doorsteps and a similar sort of response to the last general election. That's very important, you know. People were saying, we like to see you around here. Even those that wouldn't vote for us were saying, we want to see you here. We had massive support for our campaign from Conservatives from all across London. And that all bodes well for a, for a smashing general election whenever that comes. Even in inner city seats? Oh yes, absolutely, in inner city seats. Up and down the country. See, the Alliance were able to import many more people than we were this time. They can't do that at a general election. I, I predict that the Conservatives are going to continue to do well in the inner cities. Is it important from your point of view that Michael Foote stays on as Labour, le Labour leader? Oh, that's a matter for Michael Foote. He's twice denied that he's going to um, resign. I suspect on the fourth time he says he won't resign. I suspect he might go then. Now, I'm trying to find out what's happening behind us. I don't know if any of my, my colleagues know. It looks as if we've probably ended another stage of the count. The, uh, the count is going fairly smoothly, from what I can gather. Let's, uh, let's leave it here for a moment and go back to Alistair Burnett in the studio. Uh, Peter, it does seem, I think, that it's the enthusiasm of the Liberal Alliance which is breaking out now and again. At least, Peter, you had a very candid Conservative candidate there admitting that he lost his deposit. So, uh, one way or another, perhaps at uh, this particular hour of the night, uh, moving on towards one o'clock, uh, that we can reconstruct for ourselves what has happened in Bermondsey before the mayor or the returning officer condescends to tell us. I think it's generally agreed, first, that the Liberal, Mr Simon Hughes, has won, and it's said, perhaps quite reliably, that he's got double the vote of the Labour candidate, who appears to be second, it looks as if Mr O'Grady, who is the real Bermondsey Labour candidate, is coming in third. His deposit may be in doubt if there's been such a slide away from him as today's indications suggest. The Conservative has accepted that he has lost his deposit and the other candidates, uh, there's 12 of them, they presumably were reconciled to losing their deposit a very long time ago. Well now, Mr Kinnock... Um, you don't have any ambitions immediately to run the Labour Party or be the deputy head of the Labour Party. Would you like <laughs> Mr Foote to fight the next election and lose it? And then your generation, your generation can come in and contest the leadership for sir. At two brute. No, I, 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 go on, look, my, go apart on. from, tell, tell apart from the fact yes. that Michael is literally the beloved leader of our Labour Party. He's also just about my best friend. And I could wish him nothing more than the very best for himself. So consequently, there are no contrivances or connivings uh, that could commend the idea of Michael not winning the election 
are not uh, flourishing in every possible way. So but he's not a very well man. Uh, yes, I mean, he is. His eyesight, uh, he's no, no. admitted, is not as good as it should be. Well, of course. Yeah. I, he had a dreadful car accident uh, which smashed him to pieces 20 years ago. Uh, it was only his immense physical fitness that actually pulled him through then. Uh, and he is now a very fit man, as it happens, mainly because of the physical exercise that he uh, fastidiously undertakes every morning uh, that I know to my cost. But, uh, I mean, physically he's very fit. There's a deterioration in his one eye as a consequence of an infection a few years ago. But that's not in the least. That could happen to a man of 30 as it could happen to a man of 60 or any other age or a woman. And it's sad, but it doesn't uh, interfere with his general well-being. He's, he's a very fit fellow. I, and I'm actually surprised by people who are in daily acquaintance with him in the commons, I mean, you know, journalists and so on, who could entertain the idea that he is not fit because he bounces, and they know that he does. So whatever other criticisms might, people might want to make about Michael or any, any windows of any other kind, the question of physical fitness simply shouldn't be entertained. He's an extremely fit individual. Now, he's plainly committed to a number of policies, particularly nuclear disarmament yeah. and other policies. Do you think that personal commitment is enough to carry him over this sort of disappointment and keep him in the running? Oh, certainly, uh, especially since these are policies for which Michael has worked for 30 years or more. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work for them for 25 years, and there are many of my generation who have worked for much that time or perhaps slightly less. They now are not just the majority policies of the Labour Party, but the convinced, committed policies of the Labour Party. Many of them enjoy very substantial support throughout the country, most notably our policies to combat unemployment, and increasingly our policies to try and secure peace. And uh, as a consequence, uh, obviously that uh, buoys up our belief uh, that our policies are right and relevant and related to the modern realities that Britain has to face. And that assists us all uh, in maintaining morale when, for other superficial reasons, uh, we don't appear to be doing too well, for instance, in today's by-election. Mr. Freud, just observing Mr. Foote as leader of the opposition, do you think that the public view, which we showed on the Gallup poll a little while ago, the people don't think he's doing a good job, is that valid? Do you think Mr. Foote enjoys his job in the House of Commons? I think he enjoys his job. I think the public are cruel, but then politics are cruel. Um, Neil is absolutely right. Um, he's, he's a superman to be with. Um, he's well, he bounces, he's stimulating. But I think once the public decide that someone is not going to be a success, um, the public do abandon people, and especially politicians. I, I don't want to be pedantic about something you've just said. You, you mentioned Mr. O'Grady, and you said that he was not uh, a real Bermondsey Labour. Sorry, I said he was the real Bermondsey Labour ah, candidate. But That's he what he wasn't. Himself. He is, in fact, um, the Bermondsey real Labour. It isn't Bermondsey which is real. It was uh, the Labour Party which, <laughs> in Mr. O'Grady... That's not I, pedantic. I, if you'll excuse me being pedantic, that was semantic. <laughs> <laughs> At this time of the night, I'm prepared to accept any correction of that nature if it uh, clarifies Mr. O'Grady's position. I don't think we're going to hear from him again for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, now, Mr. Parkinson, do you think That's Mr. It, Foote is, is enjoying his job in the House of Commons? I mean, it is... I accepted, I think, among a number of MPs that Mrs. Thatcher, as Prime Ministers normally can, can bring better metal, better weight, uh, better information to bear in their exchanges. Mm. Now, does a man go on like this forever? Does a man go into a general election that, by all the signs, and certainly the latest signs tonight, he knows he's going to lose? I don't think he can look forward to those Tuesday and Thursday afternoon sessions in the House of Commons, because time... After time, he comes off worst. But what I find uh, rather sad about his performance, and I almost, from the very moment I went into the House, have been fascinated by people's performance in the chamber. And he has made some magnificent speeches, uh, which I've listened to with great admiration. He just doesn't seem capable of making them anymore. And one listens to his speeches in the House, and he's shuffling his papers, and he seems slightly ill at ease. And you can see his own party slightly bemused by this loss of his command of what was once 
uh, the place where he really did shine, which is the House of Commons. Uh, so, you know, he's not my leader, he's not my problem. Uh, but I would have thought that it must be a worry to Labour members to see him not doing well where he was once so very good. He was always brilliant um, extemporaneously. Uh, I think we noticed when he became Secretary of State for Employment and was actually given a brief and started speaking from the dispatch box with notes, which he never did in the days when one so admired him, um, that a great deal of sparkle left his performance. And it must be very difficult. Now, are some of us writing his obituary tonight? Well... As a politician? Some you, of us. You better not, because he's <laughs> one of the greatest obituary writers of all time. <laughs> <laughs> and he's very as well. I honestly hope we're not, actually. <laughs> well, now, let's go back to this liberal victory. Would you accept, Mr. Freud, that despite what you have said, it has been a vote against Mr. Tatchell's particular politics, the politics which I have here a copy of the Labour Herald, which possibly you don't read uh, generally. Not often. In which he talks about, or the, the, the article talks about, this new militant fighting party in Bermondsey which campaigns alongside the local people and advocates radical policies to tackle the problems. But it would seem that the local people have given that the thumbs down. Yes, I, I, I would absolutely agree with you. Um, what surprises and delights me is that having given Mr. Thatchell, Thatchell the thumbs down, they neither voted for the Bermondsey Real Labour nor for the Conservative, but took a man who worked hard, who had a marvellous team behind him, and I, I think it shouldn't be forgotten that the Liberal by-election team is, is quite expert. But there it was. They voted for him when the opinion polls thought should have voted either for Grady as a long stop or certainly for the Conservatives who had 25%. And is, they've lost 17 or 18% of that. It's, it's impressions that count in politics, and the funny way that they stick. I'm certain that there are probably people uh, turning up to the polls today and voting against Peter Tatchell, who last week were automatically taking their grievances to him in the knowledge that he would be taking them up, writing to the appropriate authority, pursuing the case. But the impression that those people had gathered comes from an assortment of sources, and impressions are something that politicians have got to be concerned about. Aris Tony said 50 years ago that it should be possible for a party like an individual to both be both sensible and trenchant. He went on to say that unless and until the Labour Party could convince the British people, particularly the British people, uh, that its uh, idealism was not <coughs> lunacy, nor its realism mere torpor, then it couldn't win. And the unfortunate thing is that in the zeal to represent people, understandable, completely to be supported, demonstrated by people like Peter Tatchell, um, who is an absolutely committed uh, young fellow, really is, uh, it can, the impression can be conveyed that there is a certain unrealism and lunacy about it, where actually all it is is an enthusiasm for the pursuit of a course. I'm not saying it's harmless, youthful enthusiasm. Peter Tatchell is much too mature to warrant uh, those descriptions. And then on the other hand, for those who will uh, offer the rationalizations, the pragmatic answers, that looks like torpor. And then along comes the Liberal Party, never having actually to keep any promise ever made, can simultaneously appear to be realistic by making no promises and idealistic by making no promises in fairly lurid language and people who want to check away their votes can find a repository. Now, I'm not saying that's unique to the Liberal Party. The SDP gets a bit of that. The major beneficiaries over the years from time to time have been the nationalists. We've got the governed by election, for instance, in your own home country, Alistair, in uh, December 1973, they got belted in govern, which is even more Labour than Bermondsey, if it, if it can be believed. Got belted. Three months later, Margot MacDonald lost a seat. We had a uh, govern was Labour again. So those kind of things can occur. And uh, given the unique set of circumstances today, uh, there are old, old stories. An impression was conveyed about Peter Tatchell. I believe it to be basically inaccurate. I think it's quite likely that he will be the Labour candidate next time and it was, we'll, the result will be reversed. Mr Hughes will be out. Well, now, I, you mentioned the SDP and I understand that Mrs Shirley Williams, yes, there she is with Glyn Mathias. Glyn? 
Mrs. Will Mrs. Williams, what's your reaction to what looks like a quite amazing Liberal victory? Well, I watched Neil Kinnock apparently explaining it all away, and I can only say he's got a heck of a lot of explanation to do, because this is one of the safest Labour seats in the whole country. It's an absolutely runaway, sensational victory for the Liberal Party and for the Alliance, and I think it shows that the safest seats are now totally in danger. It does one other thing which is very important. It shows that Cecil Parkinson's statement that the Alliance only threatened the Conservatives and not Labour is absolute rubbish, which I always thought it was, because clearly we can win a seat like this. Now, is the SDP also claiming some credit for this victory, or is it entirely a Liberal doing? No, it's not entirely, but it's largely. Let's be honest, it's largely to the credit of Simon Hughes, the candidate who fought, has been working here for three years. I think it owes a great deal to the effort the Liberal Party's put in. I think we put in our bit too, because perhaps what we've given to the Liberals is one thing, which is an answer to the argument this is a wasted vote. The combination of the Liberals and the SDP is a much more effective answer to that argument than either party on its own. Well, now, the SDP failed to capture Peckham, uh, the neighbouring constituency, but the Liberals have managed to capture Bermondsey. So they have. That does reflect a little badly on the SDP, perhaps. Well, I don't know. It's, it, it's very hard to say, really. I think Dick Tavern did extremely well in Peckham. But the great difference is that Peckham was an area where an awful lot of people wouldn't vote. It had nothing like the community spirit of Bermondsey. I worked in both by-elections. I could see the difference, that Bermondsey's got a much stronger central source of community spirit on which to draw. Peckham was essentially a fragmented constituency, a lot of bedsitter people, a lot of people who've got no particular commitment to the constituency. And I think that, um, I mean, all credit to Simon Hughes, I think it just shows really that the Alliance can win virtually any safe seat if it puts in enough work. But can the Alliance hold such safe seats? It's a big question. It's not as easy to do as winning a by-election. But you see, what I think is actually happening before our eyes is that the great bastions of Labour and Conservatives are now breaking up. And so I think maybe that all bets are off. All the old assumptions about what could and couldn't be done are off. The, it's fair to say, I think the newspapers assumed that Bermondsey was going to be Liberals come third. I think it's a perfectly fair statement to make uh, at the beginning of the campaign. Nobody has really placed the alliance in the right place yet because nobody has estimated correctly the impact that we can have on a particular campaign. And I think in a general election campaign that the alliance will pick up thousands upon thousands of votes in the course of the campaign itself. Now, a lot of the members of, of your party have been rather worried in recent months at the declining momentum of the alliance and of the SDP in particular. Is this really going to change much of that? Yes. I, I think... I, I've said it before. I mean, there are a lot of members of our parties, and particularly the SDP, who think that political success comes easy. I think they're learning it doesn't. They've stuck by us, but they've had their volatile moments, their ups and downs. I think they now realise that you've got to fight very hard indeed to crack a system as well established and as long established as this one is. I have no doubt that this victory will give them an extraordinary shot in the arm. I think we'll go on to Darlington, which is going to be an SDP seat in the north of England, with a feeling that we can win that seat as well. And I believe that combination, if we can do that, will take us into the local council elections with a total conviction that we're going to pick up an awful lot of council seats. But Darlington is a much different kind of seat, isn't it? It's a marginal and not yes. the kind of safe uh, Labour seat of this kind. No, but it's a Labour seat. It's in the north of England. It's the sort of seat that we ought to do well in. And you see, I think what Bermondsey says more clearly than any other single thing is that the Labour Party is finished, that it's disintegrating before our eyes, that it's not likely ever to form another government, that its leaders are all at sixes and sevens, they can't agree among one another, that it shot itself in the foot, if I may use that phrase, and that in a sense what's now happening is that the Labour Party is revealing every day that passes more clearly that it's in a terminal illness, and that will affect Darlington just as it's affected Bermondsey. But do sporadic successes like this uh, give any indication at all that the Conservatives can be stopped from being the next government after well, the next election? I think the great problem with the Conservatives, Glenn, is that they are now, they have been clearly moving to the right. Mrs Thatcher's confidence in herself is so great that she's beginning to talk in terms of doing things which are almost unthinkably right-wing, like her family policy, like the idea of savaging the welfare state, educational vouchers and so on. And so I think what we've got, to, if we can get across the electorate, the feeling, and I believe we can, that the Alliance can stop the Tories and nobody else can, then I think we stand a chance of even winning the next general election. I really believe that. Mrs Williams, thank you very much. Now back to Alistair Burnett. Thank you. Lynn, Mr Parkinson, you heard Mrs Williams. 
In one thing, she is right, though, isn't she, that at uh, successive general elections, the Liberals have put up their share of the vote from where the opinion polls left them at the start of the campaign. You're not a bit worried no, about that? No, only, only by quite a small amount, a very small amount. Uh, and this idea which Roy Jenkins was trying to promote the other day, that we consistently produce 10 to 12 percent more in an election than we do in the normal running of the polls is only true of by-elections. In by-elections you do get an exaggerated movement and I've found it very interesting listening to Clement Freud saying we have a very good liberal by-election team and the reason is very simple the liberals are good at fighting one seat at a time. We've had instances before where we've put them to the test and made them fight two seats at a time and they lost Uxbridge on the day they won Sutton and Cheen. They simply couldn't sustain two campaigns on the same day. Well, when we have the general election, they're going to have to stay, sustain 650. And all those people who've been living in Bermondsey will be up in their various seats all over the country trying to retain them. And Mrs. Williams must be very worried. She won Crosby. But five months later in the local elections, we had a majority of nearly 8,000 over the... Uh, alliance in that seat. So she's got problems, and you notice how she hedged uh, when she was asked about the general election. May I just make two points? First of all, I have made a statement of fact, which has been true up to tonight, that the alliance had never won a seat from Labour. It had only won seats from Conservatives. That was a statement of fact. The next thing is that the Alliance and the, uh, the Liberals and the SDP have had tremendous arguments about the 80 seats which they consider most winnable. And those are the seats that they've been squabbling about dividing between themselves. What are those 80 seats in common? 78 of them are Conservative. So they know where their best hope lies, and they know that their role, if they have a role, is to damage us. And Mrs. Williams might uh, huff and puff like that, but those are simple facts. And they've been squabbling about those 80 seats because they know that the ones they think they can win. May I just make one last point? She talks about the family policy group. The family policy group, amongst other things, in the field of education, where she was a disastrous Secretary of State, is actually in the business of trying to find ways of increasing parental choice. Now, we know she doesn't believe in parental choice. She was the person who persecuted the grammar schools. She was the person who prevented the children of people without adequate means from going to direct grant schools. She has a very autocratic attitude to education. She has the effrontery to say we're moving to the right. She was the most autocratic education secretary we ever had. Well, after so Mrs. Mrs. Parkinson, Thatcher. it's extraordinary on this point, and uh, it's nice to be able to talk on a by-election program about policies. Yeah, I, uh, he's got the most extraordinary idea of choice. Uh, I, he, as part of the commercial party, uh, would I would have thought understood that in order for choice to exist, especially in matters of access to fundamentally important facilities like education and health and so on, it must be universal. And it can't be described as being democratic choice if it is measured by the size of the purse. And by the policies pursued over the last three or four years, in fact, we've seen choice eroded for substantial numbers of people by the cuts, by closures, and by the fact that more and more and more, as Her Majesty's Inspectorate have twice reported, and will be reporting again this year, uh, opportunities in the curriculum Provision of materials in classes, numbers of teachers have been removed, withdrawn, lost to the majority of children in schools in this country. That's not an uh, extension of choice. That's a destruction of choice, surely. We are spending more in real terms, or as much in real terms, as you were when you were in government, and school roles have been falling. Mm, and therefore, every time a school is closed, the Labour Party claims that that must mean uh, that uh, numbers on school registers in other schools are rocketing. Actually, the school population has been closing, which is why schools have been closing. Mm. And I know that in your utopian world, keeping empty schools open would be a demonstration of some sort of idea. What it would do for the education system, I really can't think. <laughs> what Keith Joseph who's, said... Who's ever said what, any of that? What, uh, well, you implied it. No, you implied, no, no, oh, no, yes, no. you did. Yes, you did. And none of it's true. And may I just say this? You uh, talk uh, about... Uh, 
we're not interested in extending choice. What Keith Joseph said in the House of Commons, if we can find a practical way of extending choice, we are determined to do so. Mm. And I think that that is an uh, ambition which most people in this country would welcome. And this idea that the present system is absolutely perfect and all we need to do is to mm. pour more mm. money into it, which is what both oh, of you, by the, the way, last, are promising the last in the course of your various campaigns. No, that's it's the last just thing. not... Can I just, thing come in and say just in one sentence, if uh, Keith Joseph wants to extend choice, all he's got to do is to put the 27,000 university places back that he's taken away, the 14,000 polytechnic places back that he's taken away, and the £700 million taken away from schooling, which is more than proportionate to the fall in school roles. Now, if you say that the schooling system now is imperfect, yeah, I got good breathing. I, if you say it's imperfect now, how could it be made better with less resources? Which is the argument that you're actually making, that less will actually make it better. But you're, you are adopting the classic Labour, and if I may say liberal approach, because they and their partners are in the business of promising huge increases in public spending too. You are in the business of assuming that so the more President money Reagan, you spend, the, the better the standards that you provide. And that simply hasn't been borne out by the facts. Yes, it does. Uh, now, oh, no, now, it hasn't. I think now, Mr. Freud, I think, must uh, bring this debate to a close. We're we're going to talk about the by-election in just a moment, but do help us about education. Well, I, I want to say that the first absolutely proper and true thing that Cecil Parkinson has said tonight is school roles are falling. He, he is right. School roles are falling. I say, having been I'm in Bermondsey, you know. one of the most extraordinary things was that the discontent of the people with education and with health... I want to take up two things that Cecil Parkinson said. The first one, point. no. The education no, I, system I, in inner London is the yeah. most expensive we have. Yeah. We spend more money in that area. the most era. problems. Yes, and the inner most London problems. Inner London has got yep. more problems than any other square part of the whole but of the country. But you had a point to make. Yes, I had two points to make. Cecil Parkinson said, um, we don't take votes. The Liberals don't take votes. So he, he didn't say... Um, the alliance never won, which he now says he said. Um, but when he said that of the 80 seats which the alliance thought were the most winnable, we were quite simply going on the performance of the previous liberal or near-liberal candidates. This was our 501st choice for an election. We got 6.8%. And if we can win this, all I'm saying is that we will have to revise what our most winnable seats are. He's quite right in saying, of course, it's easier when there's only one by-election than two. But after the good appeal that he's made for more troops to help in liberal by-elections, <laughs> um, I think you will find that we'll probably able to fight two or three or four <laughs> at one time. All right, Mr. Freud, I think it is true to say that the Liberal Alliance have done well in the safe seats of the other two parties, where perhaps the local machine is run down, there are local squabbles and so on. Your problem, I think, in the past, as a Liberal Party certainly, has been in those marginal seats contested between Conservative and Labour. Now, this Darlington seat, which is coming up, and I understand there's a view that it may even be fought uh, by the end of March. That's right. Do you actually think you can win Darlington when the other two parties are encamped there as strongly as they are? Yes, I do. I think we can certainly put up an exceedingly good show. And I think we may win. Um, certainly what has happened tonight is going to be exceedingly helpful in Darlington because I know that Cecil Parkinson doesn't believe greatly in proportional representation. Not at all. But while we do not have it... The only way we can show the benefits of it is by this sort of upset election, because it shows the benefit that people would have if they could actually get the result they wanted. But they seem to have got, according to you, the result they wanted without proportional representation. That's right. But at a general election, it will be enormously helpful if people will, have, will be able to say, this is my first choice. And then national opinion polls will show something quite different, because at the moment... People are voting according to the question they're asked, not according to their political conviction. But Clement Freud is seeking really only party advantage in pursuing proportional representation. The very yeah. thing, yes, the very thing that he's, uh, he and other liberals and, and social democrats accuse other people of. 
See, the, the thing is that he must know in any conceivable system of proportional representation in this country, we would be left with a strong probability of a large party with a large number of seats in Parliament dependent upon an alliance with a party with a small number of seats. And the tail would therefore wag the dog, the tail, of course, being appropriately Clement's tail. And Could so, be your dog. so consequently, I, it, it conceivably, but in that case, you certainly wouldn't be the tail, Clement, I have to tell you that. But the, the uh, consequence would be uh, an amount of power for that minority party, wildly out of proportion to the support which it commanded in the country. That is not a democratic outcome to an election, not certainly as British people understand it and want it. And the idea that PR would advance democracy and accountability and the validity of votes in this country is an absolute nonsense. And I wish the Liberals would stop purveying it, though I don't expect them to, because there's so many other nonsenses that it gets lost among the rest. But you believe the government elected by 28% of the people who have the right to vote gives them a mandate to I do... Think it's, I think it's much better than the government that is dictated to by a party that couldn't even raise, let's say, 20 or 30 seats. It would at least represent over 50% of the population of that wouldn't be a bad idea. Well, I, gentlemen, we are, I think one ought to <coughs> recall to mind that we are actually waiting for the result of a democratically conducted election, though there have been critics of it, in Bermondsey. And although we are assuming that we know that the Liberal has won and won easily, uh, that the Labour Party is second and that the uh, Bermondsey Real Labour or Real Bermondsey Labour or Labour Real Bermondsey Party is going to run third and the Conservative has lost his deposit, we would like to know, I think now from you, Peter, how is the count coming along? Well, we've elicited all that about the candidates, uh, Alistair, and about the result. The count seems to be on target, but it's a slow business because of this long ballot paper with 16 names on. And frankly, the people here are getting a bit restless because they know the result. What they want to do is cheer the winner or boo the winner. They want, uh, they want to stage the, the little demonstrations they've got in mind for when the declaration is actually made. Uh, what is happening now is that the, the thing is getting a bit restless. Uh, a few moments ago, the GLC leader, Ken Livingstone, was spotted in the corner of the hall and the National Front supporters started giving him a fairly rough time. Uh, and they were uh, responded to from the other side by supporters of the Revolutionary Communist Party and other uh, people who uh, think that uh, Ken Livingstone has been getting a, a raw deal. Um, the returning officer, just a word about him, I don't know if we can see him down on the, the floor, Mike Geeta, uh, the mayor of Southwark, is uh, uh, remarkable to, in one small respect, he's the first returning officer that I've ever seen who is sporting a CND badge. He says that uh, it's council policy and he's very pleased to carry it out. He's been a veteran of Aldermaston marches. He's a member of the Labour Party. There he is. He's a member of the Labour Party for 25 years. And he's the man that you'll see later on. I should think in about uh, 20 minutes' time or so, uh, making the declaration in the Bermondsey by-election. One interesting point is that Bermondsey last had uh, a non-Labour MP uh, in 1931-35. In fact, in, in pre-war, there were two constituencies with the name Bermondsey in it. There was Bermondsey Rotherhide and West Bermondsey. And Bermondsey Rotherhide had a Conservative MP, Mrs. Runge, between 31 and 35. And West Bermondsey had a Liberal MP, the Reverend Kedward, in 1923-24. That's the last time there was a Liberal MP in Bermondsey. Since then, um, the Labour, since the war, the, the Labour majority has never been lower than 5,900. The lowest majority they've ever had here, Labour, was 91, but there's been a Labour candidate here, except for the that Conservative and that uh, Liberal, um, non-stop since 1918. The highest Labour majority there's ever been was 21,002 in 1951. But that brings us back to the prospects for tonight. The turnout tonight, just to remind you, 57.7% turnout compared with 59.3% at the general election, so slightly down, but still a good turnout. Incidentally, the Liberal Alliance win on 57.7% turnout will be the lowest turnout in which they've gained a seat so far. At Croydon Northwest, the turnout was 62.8%. That was the previous 
lowest turnout on which there was uh, an alliance gain in a by-election in, in this parliament. Uh, Peter, we've been watching while you've been talking some of the candidates uh, about the room. Uh, they're not betraying anything in their features to uh, upset the forecast of the result? No, the party professionals, um, as you know, and I'm sure as the Conservative of, the, cha of the, uh, the, the Chairman of the Conservative Party knows, have a very shrewd idea uh, by the middle of the day on polling day what the result is. I remember at Glasgow Hill Head, Alistair, the Conservative candidate Jerry Malone, I think, made uh, by-election history, certainly in, t certainly in terms of our coverage of by-elections, by conceding defeat on air. That was the first time that's happened, uh, to my knowledge. And here at um, Bermondsey, we've had the Liberal Alliance candidate claim victory. We've had uh, Peter Tatchell concede defeat. We've had the Conservatives say he's lost his deposit. Perhaps this is a, a welcome new trend because the professionals actually can tell. They, 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 they've, they've done this sort of thing before. They know which way the wind is blowing. And I get the feeling that in the past, we've had the wool pulled over our eyes quite a lot to the last minute when people have kept their cards pretty close to their chest. Perhaps that trend is now uh, about to end. Well, that's right, Peter. Of course, in 1959, Hugh Gatesco rather shocked the Labour Party and other people by conceding defeat very early on indeed in the night. And quite often people, as you say, do bluff it out. Of course, for you tonight, there's going to be this uh, particular pleasure of 16 candidates responding uh, and, and uh, to the vote of thanks to the returning officer. Uh, by, I mean, you may not be able to tell us when the returning officer is going to favour us with the result, but do you think you're going to see the dawn rise uh, well, in Bermondsey? I, um, well, I'm luckily um, not, uh, not involved in my programme's coverage tomorrow, so I think I'll leave that to one of my colleagues here to, to sit through all that. Um, I, hope, I hope they keep it fairly short. Um, what the, 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 the other the real difficulty, of course, for uh, the, uh, the commentator here, like myself, is uh, slotting in the title of the candidate in between... Uh, the party label of the candidate in between the moment that the returning officer uh, says the name, Alan Baker, Esmond Bevan, and the moment he gives the numbers. And we also have another problem at ITN, of course, with 16 lots of numbers. Uh, the, uh, the technicians who stick uh, them into our computer, our VTAT computer, have a job which they've never had before. Uh, but I'm sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure we're all up to it, but we've got to keep our ears open. Well, Peter, you'll, Peter, you'll have to, because if you put the name of the Looney Party against any other, I think we'll all be in trouble. Well, I've been wondering what to abbreviate that to, frankly, Alistair. I, whether I should slip in official or monster or raving or loony um, <laughs> without uh, attracting too much uh, disapprobation. Fine. Peter, we'll come back um, just as soon as you have some news. Uh, Clement, you had a word. Yes, talking about having wool pulled over our eyes, um, the fact that no one gave the Liberals a chance until the National Opinion Poll showed us to have a very good chance, which we always knew, um, does seem to me to show that the press um, were either less honest than they might have been uh, or less smart than they should have been. Wait a minute, what's this business about always knew we had a good chance? The seat was the SDP's to start with. Then the SDP lad pulled out in the, hope, in the hope that some illustrious national figure would come in. None appeared, so the vacant shoes were occupied by the gallant Mr Hughes. And, I mean, that's the story of what's actually occurred inside the alliance in Bermondsey. Not actually true. Simon Hughes fought in the Great Anunnaki Council. Oh, sure, I know, I know that. I uh, know that. It was our seat. Yes. It was Joe Taylor, and it became Simon Hughes. But isn't it true yes, that Mr. Mellish delayed his resignation in the hope that Mrs. Williams would fight the seat? Well, I think that may well be true. But uh, there was some positional play at the time. But it is very good to see that for the first time since the 1931 election, we now have two Liberal... Greater London Members of Parliament, and that is much to be welcomed. What does the Times say? Who, who has won the election? Well, the Times has already accepted the result of the election, as we all have, and uh, for Mr Kinnock, who has been very gallantly defending Mr Foote tonight, the Times headline is, Healy Takeover Gains Majority Backing in Shadow Cabinet. How come you didn't tell us this, Mr Kinnock, I mean, earlier on? And I, I understand, too, from a quick look, that there's a star role for you. Is there indeed? You've been very reticent. I, indeed. Modesty <laughs> is naturally part of my nature, so is honesty. And uh, perhaps I don't, I don't know who the story's by, but I, I certainly haven't got 
the gift of dramatic uh, invention that whoever wrote that has got. I think you'll find in all the rest of the press, they're knocking that story down. Uh, the they often do, of course, do yeah, good stories. Actually, since the, since the time, yes, yeah, it's a good story. Whether it's true or not is something that doesn't too frequently borrow, bother much of, of Fleet Street. Especially, if I may say so, sadly, especially with the Times, since it spell in, fell under the spell of Mr. Murdoch, the Times is, even the Times has gone for sensation on its front page at the risk sometimes of, of inaccuracy. So, and that's a blatant case of it there. So you now deny, specifically this paragraph, party sources said last night that Mr. Neil Kinnock, who, it says Mr. Foote himself favours, will become deputy leader under this arrangement. Well, somebody better tell me about it. <laughs> it's absolutely rot. I don't know if it carries any emolument, however. Um, the other uh, paper which has come in, and uh, Mr. Kinnock will take uh, great acceptance of this, I have no doubt, it simply says, can foot survive? And that is the Daily Mail, whose opinion polls, I think we've all agreed, has had, uh, have had some influence on this election. So uh, it does seem rightly or wrongly, Mr. Kinnock, that you're going to be in for a long weekend of Can Foot Survive. Now, what should Mr. Foot do? Well, Mr. Foot uh, should, despite what Clement Freud said earlier, and there's always a risk, of course, of repetitive assertion of staying, that, uh, a risk that goes with it, obviously, but uh, Michael Foot should, uh, and I, I think possibly will, uh, firmly assert that he is staying, that he will fight the next election, and that Labour will win it. I think that's what he should do. I think that's what he will do. On a matter of fact, Mr Kinnock, is it true that you're only 40? That's what the Times says. Yes, I will be 40 for another five weeks. Ah. And then I will be 41. <laughs> so you are the next generation that's, uh, that's coming up. It's well, a funny thing in this business of politics. Uh, uh, it's the only profession in which you can be 40 and described as young. <laughs> it's fantastic, <laughs> isn't it? Well, now, two youthful-looking uh, other gentlemen. Mr. Foote, as we've said earlier on, is someone, and you have candidly confessed it, uh, Mr. Parkinson, someone, uh, Mr. Parkinson, that you want to see leading the Labour Party because you see advantage to it. If you were in the position of the Labour Party now, would you be mounting some uh, little conspiracy to get rid of the leader, the unsuccessful leader? The Conservative Party is sometimes mm. more ruthless than the Labour Party in these matters. I, th I think I would uh, remind myself of how he came to be there. I'd remind myself of the tremendous warfare that went on uh, between uh, Healy and Ben. Uh, I've seen nothing in recent months that suggests to me that they've grown more fond of each other uh, or that uh, the attitudes they represent have become closer. Uh, and I would have thought that having uh, looked around the field, I'd come to the conclusion we were probably better off as we were uh, and uh, stick with the man we had. In a sense, uh, Mr. Kinnock, the writer of this article in the Times uh, has, I think, that in mind for your own behaviour. He says... Mr. Kinnock has been notable for his low Westminster profile in the past weeks and months. This, he said, is seen as an indication that he does not wish to soil his hands with the mechanics of dropping his close friend, the leader. That Your is... smile is continuous. I, it's getting... Uh, it's a, a st who wrote that? Uh, Mr. Anthony Bevins, <laughs> political correspondent. Ah, well, no, Well, then. now, be careful I, what you say. Tony he Bevins, may be listening. By times, I hope he is. In which case, I will look straight into the... Which camera is it? <laughs> Whichever and you say, wish. if you're listening, Tony, uh, I recall your background and you really dropped an absolute scrammer this time. Because if you wonder about my absence from Westminster, as you describe it, you can have a photocopy of my diary over recent weeks and discover that I have consistently been campaigning out of Westminster in the country by invitation and I think that that is, generally speaking, more productive for the fortunes of the Labour Party and the advancement of socialism than sitting around the tea room in the House of Commons whinging. Well, that's or gossiping to you, Tony. It may just be that that's conclusive. Uh, we'll certainly accept it as such. Now, gentlemen, we're, we're waiting for this result. I don't know how much of the country, or indeed how much of Bermondsey is waiting since it has been so well forecast. But one of the reasons is that there are 16 candidates. It's difficult for them to handle. And I think the question is, and it has been raised quite widely, 
Do you want there to be a series of by-elections with 16 or more candidates, or do you want to change the rules in some way? Should the deposit be made greater, or should, in fact, there be a larger number of people than the just the 10 who have to endorse a candidate's chances now? Would you like it to be 250 or something like that? What would you like, Mr. Freud? I'd like to keep the deposit within the financial limits of anyone who is a genuine candidate. And I would like them to show the genuineness of their candidature by getting the signatures of half a percent of the electorate, simply to agree to that man standing as a candidate in the next parliamentary election. So in Bermondsey, that would mean about 275 signatures. And I'm quite sure that of the 16, probably 10 wouldn't have been able to get that number, wouldn't even have bothered to have gone and seen 275 households. But I do think it is a mistake um, to deter somebody for financial reasons from standing for Parliament. Well, perhaps we have an opportunity, while we are waiting for the count from Bermondsey, uh, to look at some of the facts about this, how you can, should, and what you have to pay in order to stand for Parliament at a by-election like this. It's said there's a misuse of the free mail and other publicity that people have. The deposit of £150, well, actually was brought in in 1918, and, of course, at present values for the pound, whatever that is tonight, it would certainly be up at 1500 perhaps even 2000 And there is a question of just uh, what you would need, what percentage you would need to have to save your deposit in those terms, or whether you need the backing of more actual voters in the constituency before you can lodge your candidacy. Our political correspondent, David Walters, has been looking at this. Bill Bokes, seen here at Hill Head, would have made Bermondsey his 29th parliamentary contest, but he had to withdraw because of ill health. He started fighting elections in 1951, but recently he's been joined by more and more fringe candidates. At Croydon Northwest in 1981, there were 12 in the race, including a pearly king. And even at the last general election, Jeremy Thorpe had eight opponents, including a dog lovers party contender, Auburn War. Auburn Alexander War, 79. So what do the fringe candidates get for their £150 deposit? Well, first there's the free postage, an election address to every voter. That can be worth up to £10,000 altogether. Then there's coverage on the media. The law says that television and radio have to give all candidates a mention. And, of course, elections provide a platform to plug anything from Citizens Band Radio to Southampton University's RAG. The Commons Home Affairs Select Committee are discussing changing the rules to stop abuses. There are two main options. First, the deposit could be raised. If it had gone up by the rate of inflation, it should be over £2,000 now. To make things easier for genuine candidates, the 12.5% threshold to save the deposit would be lowered at the same time. Secondly, candidates could be asked to obtain far more than the ten signatures they need now before they were allowed to stand for Parliament. Uh, if you stand in the street, you can get someone to sign almost anything, but you'd have to check to see that they were on the register of electors. That would be time-consuming and expensive. Uh, I don't think that's the answer either. I think um, the real uh, solution is the deposit, because, after all, we are talking about very substantial sums of money. If you have a field of uh, several candidates, you might be talking of £100,000 or more for a constituency. That's a lot of money for the taxpayer to put up. I think people talk as if the deposit was the only expense you incur in an election. You've got to spend thousands of pounds. I mean, the constituencies are getting larger for, for most people. The cost of fighting an election within the permitted expenses is getting larger. You've got to find over the country many, many hundreds of thousands of pounds. And if on top of that you've got to find half a million and put it on one side and say that can't be touched, we may get m nearly all of it back, but then we might lose some of it, then you're impairing your ability to fight an election unless you're a very wealthy party. And it strikes me very forcibly that it is a wealthy party which is keenest on this proposal. The Liberals' arguments are strongly supported by the fledgling Ecology Party, whose headquarters here in South London are run on a shoestring. They lost all 53 deposits at the last election, yet they are, on any definition, a legitimate political party. Like the Liberals, they'd rather see a system of signatures. But there could be another solution. I think I would raise a deposit, although there is a difficulty that political parties actually have to put the money down. 
and, and then the town hall sits on it until after the election. So I'd like to find a way around having to deprive people of money for that long. But yes, I'd raise the deposit by a bit. So there might be a way in which they'd have to pay a deposit, but they wouldn't actually have to put the cash down. Uh, that's what I'd like to see, although the argument against that is that some of the candidates wouldn't pay up and would then disappear. <laughs> well, the committee is expected to report in about six weeks' time, but there's no chance that the government could actually change the law before the next general election. So it's still possible that Bermondsey's record of 16 candidates in the field could be beaten. Well, there's a little stir down at Bermondsey. They've been uh, busying themselves around the microphones and uh, the returning officer has been talking to the agents. There are always a number of spoiled papers. These have got to be cleared out of the way. But it may be that they're making good enough progress to justify all the forecasts we've been giving. But while we're waiting for that, Mr Parkinson, uh, the last time you were on a by-election programme, you spoke very highly of Mr. Bokes as an example of an individual who could have his say. He cheerfully pays up his deposit time and time and time again. Yes. But are you getting fed up with that system? Well, I think it, uh, when one looks at the cost of the taxpayer now, £10,000 for the free post and so on, I think it's quite a lot of taxpayers' money to put at risk for £150. And I think we have to find a better way of qualifying people to appear on the ballot. Now, I can see the difficulties which uh, the Liberals would have and all the parties would have finding those very substantial sums. But it actually, um, it is a very temporary business if you're a serious candidate in almost every seat. So I think I accept the need for a reform of the system. I think it is just becoming a shade ridiculous. And I think this tonight has probably uh, tipped the argument over the edge. Uh, I think this has really almost reduced the thing to an absurd level. And I think there will be changes. But your colleague was quite right. They won't come in this parliament. So, uh, that might even mean an early general election. Uh, Mr Kinnock, yeah. would you really thin them out, and how I'd, would you do it? I'd like a combination of two things, but not just for the purpose of thinning out. I'd like uh, an increase in the deposit, possibly not to £1,000, but certainly an increase on 150 say five, £600. And in addition to that, a proportion of signature uh, of the electorate required to sign. But much more important, and those two factors as contributory towards... Uh, a, a great improvement in, well, I won't call it political education, I will call it citizenship education, because political education is sometimes misunderstood in this country, so that there is a greater political discernment about uh, the desirability of standing, of alternative ways of pressing cases and representing grievances, uh, of uh, people working in the knowledge that if they do want to stand for some eccentric purpose. Well, that's fair enough. I mean, this is Britain after all, and people should have the freedom to do that. But that they can expect uh, not even a, a, an amused response from a public that is much more generally aware of political issues than conventionally, in some cases, has been the case uh, in Britain. So I'd like to see our whole attitude towards the conduct of politics and the conduct of elections changed. I think we've got a model possibly West Germany, certainly the Scandinavian democracies, they uh, make a more deliberate effort to foster the idea of the responsibilities and obligations of citizenship. Politics and political activity is not treated as if it was the pastime of cranks in the way that it is to some extent in Britain. And with the result, they get a much higher turnout uh, without compulsory voting. And the elections tend to be more thoroughgoing, informative affairs than is sometimes the case in Britain. The, the turnout, Mr. Freud, though, abroad may actually be the day. I mean, if you vote on a Sunday, it's very much easier for people to go and vote, as they do in France and in, and in Germany, and uh, normally do have a higher turnout than, than we have. The Americans go to the polls on a Tuesday, uh, and we go on a Thursday. These are probably bad days. I mean, what... And the Australians fine you if you don't vote. Yes, but that, of course, is an advantage for a person with your surname with an F, you'd be high up on the ballot paper and you'd get one of the crosses, wouldn't you, automatically? A and B would be even better. I wonder whether I can bring up something quite different. After <laughs> Warrington, when the alliance increased the previous Liberal vote by 34.2%, um, newspapers were very quick to point out that if this were reflected throughout the country, the Conservatives would end up with two members of Parliament. <laughs> We were, found them as well, actually. Norman Fowler and Alec Buchanan-Smith. <laughs> now, um, if, as we are led to believe, uh, the Liberal in Bermondsey has got 
uh, it means there's been an upsurge of 44 percent, which would mean a Conservative Party represented only by Norman Fowler. <laughs> I wonder if perhaps Cecil Parkinson would tell us what sort of um, country we would have. Well, not since Cromwell's day. But <laughs> it wouldn't be yes. such a may I, may I just, may I just say... now represented only by Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> may, I just, may I just set uh, Clement's mind at uh, rest? Because in the uh, Parliament, which uh, ended in 74, uh, uh, we had a number of by-elections when the Conservative Party were in power. Let me tell him what happened to the Liberal vote at the general election following no, I, I was, I, I, In I Chesterley Street, it <laughs> fell by 53%. Oh, yes. In Ripon, it fell by 20%. In Hove, by 245 In Berwick, it went up, Alan Beath. Uh, in Edinburgh North, 38.4% fall. And in Glasgow, Govan, a comparable seat, a 76.8% fall. So my advice to you, Clement, is not to get too excited. I think it's I going think to be some time before the cares of office weigh on you. I think it's only fair to say that it's 53% of the vote that we had previously. You're making it sound as if it were 53 percentage points. We never had 53 it's, percentage points. Yeah, it's, still, it's still a very substantial fall in the vote. I'm just saying that in, within in a year after we the by-election, yes. a year after the by-election, the Liberal vote halved. It went down to below half of what it had been. So I'm just c encouraging you because I really... Rather like your that... vote has gone down <laughs> by three quarters. I wish these and two we're not making... would stop the well, temptation. What, what is being... the size of the Labour Party under your calculations, <laughs> under this ideal state in, in which you occupy many ministerial posts? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I, I won't. Uh, I, I was, but it's 113 seats uh, to Labour after Warrington. I mean, that was the projection... Um, I, I was simply mentioning it to see whether perhaps a Conservative Party under Fowler would be more fun than has been the Conservative Party under Thatcher. Well, that's something perhaps for them to worry about, and uh, it may be, after Mr Kinnock's denials, that there could be a contest for the Conservative leadership before there's one for the Labour leadership, on your calculations. <laughs> there would but be no <laughs> contest with one... <laughs> <laughs> but I, what, I can't well, there's a House of Lords. Don't forget it. the House of Lords. Yes. You haven't abolished it yet. Um, but just looking, looking to the to the next general election, which uh, must be at the back of everyone's mind. Calculating from Bermondsey, all right, it's uh, it's not uh, not a representative seat. But after Darlington, there might be a lot of uh, hardening of views about what is possible and what isn't. What do you think will determine? Mrs. Thatcher's timing in calling that election? I think she will want to keep her options open. She is quite unarguably an honest and a courageous woman, and she said she's not going to go to the country um, very early. And it's very difficult for a Prime Minister who has been elected to serve five years to go after four years without making people wonder why. Um, my, I, I would think October, because then she has the choice if the signs are not convenient or, um, I mean, if no one is very enthusiastic about October, she can go on until the new year. Uh, I think the later she leaves it, the harder it will be for her to manoeuvre. So I, I would think not June, which is the bookmaker's favourite. Um, I doubt whether she will wait till the last moment, which historically has always meant defeat. Um, October would be October the 20th, a week after her birthday. Mr. Parkinson, have you booked the halls for that day? No, we haven't. What day have you booked the halls for? Uh, we haven't settled on a day yet, but I promise we'll let you know when we do. I do hope you will. Uh, but there are certain factors, aren't there, that come into it. I mean, for one thing, it is now likely that the cost of living will rise for all sorts of factors, or at least you'll find it difficult to keep it down to where you have got it. Is another one that the American economy now does seem to be taking off after a year, two years of uh, reduced activity, recession. Uh, mm. The Dow Jones uh, was a record uh, last night, 1121 points. Now, are these the sort of factors that you keep in mind? I think that uh, you're right in saying that the uh, American economy does appear to be taking off. I was in Washington two, three weeks ago, and people are quite optimistic uh, about prospects and you've seen some of the signs come through Ford's and General Motors taking workers back yeah. 
uh, housing starts and so on. I think that's quite important for us because America's still our biggest customer. We have a very a pound which is very competitive against the dollar now, and an upsurge in the American economy would be very good news for us. And so I think uh, there are many considerations other than just inflation. I think uh, what uh, the people of this country want to see is they really believe that the government had to take very tough action. They believe that a number of the things that were done simply had to be done and that our predecessors had ducked them. Uh, and the fact that uh, we have the public support shows up continuously in the polls. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, what we do need to see and what I would like to see is the, Im the beginning of the emergence of the economy from the recession. I think that would be a most valuable asset. But that's amazing because uh, Clement says, for instance, that Mrs. Thatcher is a courageous and honest woman. Now, I don't want to be particularly personal about it, but the courage is frequently more to do with stubbornness than anything else. And the honesty is a little doubtful because we've perpetually been offered the bottoming out. Now, of course, we arrive at tonight and Cecil is saying, I understand the reasons he's saying it, is that he wants the economy to emerge from the recession. I think that the American parallel is very interesting because a couple of weeks ago, uh, Paul Falker, I've got a note of what he said here, who is uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, the central bank, said, we cannot build a successful policy against inflation on continued recession. That's exactly the point, that as long as the government continues to con contrive the particular form of recession we have in Britain, and they're going to because they've promised unchanged policies, we will not have a prolonged, successful counterinflation strategy, and meanwhile, our industrial base will be further eroded with the consequence of increasing mass unemployment. Now, when uh, Cecil says that those policies are popular in the country, no, they're not. Mrs. Thatcher has a certain kind of support. I, I, they, but they're understood to be policies demolishing whole communities. And when people are asked, actually, about their concern, Overwhelmingly, they say unemployment is the main issue. How do we get rid of uh, unemployment? We get rid of it by reducing retirement age, by increasing education and training, by more investment, and by more community programs. Again and again and again and again, those responses come out. When people realize that those are Labour Party policies, I think that when it's not obscured by the smoke of battle, as it has been for such a prolonged period, I think that we'll see a dramatic and swift change in political fortunes. So I hope Cecil Parkinson, I understand why he's doing it, doesn't confuse the standing of the Conservative Party and Mrs. Thatcher now with support for the policies, because I think there's a pretty widespread recognition amongst industrial managers, as among trade unionists, amongst mums and dads, as among their children, that we are witnessing industrial demolition, and nobody in Britain can conceivably want that. Every single uh, businessman I meet, and they're people from a whole range of industries, textile problem industries, says one thing. We simply, you simply must win the next election. Uh, if the Labour Party wins, it will be the end of this country. Now, you might not like it, but these are people know, over and over again. And what is interesting, mm. if I may just say Make this, we've done a great deal of research in, into this and a great deal of uh, analysis has been done. And the one thing that comes out very clearly is that neither your policies nor the alliance policies carry an iota of credibility. People feel they've heard it all before. Mm -hmm. And where poor old Clement Freud's in trouble this time, you see, he's always been able to say before, you can't blame us for anything. But no. this time, no. he's no. in harness with four Cecil. previous... No, four, just let me finish. No, you must four members of the previous no. Labour cabinet who actually presided over the disastrous policies, so they haven't got the clean hands which the Liberals have always liked to pretend. But look, I think the CBI, the CBI on, and the on. chemical hold industries on. and everybody, yeah. even this week, has been saying, please cut energy prices, please protect as against some forms of manufacturing they simply, imports. They say please to us, Neil, please stimulate the domestic the Labour Party now. Don't they do it on the side? We, we must give him a democratic... Yes, democratic a sure, 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 sure. sure. He's, he's there. I think what industry is actually saying, and industry has never liked change, and especially not change for the sake of change. Industry would always like whoever is in power to remain in power. What they would not like is the sort of, and the textile industry is a very good example, the sort of sweeping political change which the Labour Party would bring in. 
But I believe that to get Britain working together, the very good document which Roy Jenkins and David Seale published is something which actually industry would rather welcome. And I have only gone around most of England and heard people who have said that they have no faith in the politics in which things are changed for political ideology instead of for the good of the country. And it is quite clear, and when I said that Mrs. Thatcher was an honest and a courageous woman, I meant quite honestly that she was that politically. But her politics, I deplore, Neil deplores, she is investing in unemployment in this country when without affecting the inflation rate, she could very easily put an awful lot more people into work. How are you going to stop unemployment rising? They don't want first, to. Oh, they don't want first to of stop. all, we are spending very considerable sums of money already. If you take uh, the defence procurement, <laughs> nearly eight billion this year on equipment. I know Clement thinks no, that no, uh, defence equipment grows on trees, but actually, very Clement, I will tell my it's constituents. A very British, it's a very I will tell my constituents in British aerospace that you think that their work is a bit of a joke, and you not laughed at, at it. All. And then that again, and then dishonest, again, then cheap. again, this year. Uh, we are investing, we are spending 10.5 billion with the construction industry. We are making very, we are spending very, very substantial sums of money on public sector programs. The difference between us and our opponents is that they actually believe there is no limit to what the government can afford to spend. And this is, and this is the difference between us. And this is what the public doesn't trust about them. They keep saying they're going to spend money. You and the public the says, which they didn't we've trust heard all this before. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Kinnock, and has, the enormous a, trust Neil they Kinnock have in... has a particular problem, of course, because he represents a party which has campaigned in every single general election since it came to power, since it came into existence on the pledge to reduce unemployment. And it is a sad statistic, but an absolutely unassailable one, that no Labour government ever has reduced unemployment. And that's another reason why these crocodile tears of his yes. about unemployment actually don't cut any ice, no, if crocodile tears the can cut ice. Because you, <laughs> you know very well that uh, the figure that really matters in the terms that you are putting it is the generation of additional jobs in order to mitigate what otherwise would be an even bigger rise in unemployment. That has been the nature of the changing technology and cyclical shifts over the last 30, 40 years, no matter which government has been in. The test is who has done most to try and contest with modern policies the rise that would otherwise take place. And the Tory party under any of its leadership has no record at all there with the exception of the Eden and Macmillan governments who, by uh, being fortunate in a period of great affluence, were able to preside over labour intensivity in our economy whilst letting capital go to hell. One of the reasons why we've still got a weak economy. Now, gentlemen, just to interrupt for one moment, and I'm sorry, we do appear uh, now down at the count to have had a little confabulation. The returning officer is uh, going according to plan, and we do now expect, it's his plan, we do now expect the declaration at about 2 o'clock. No hitches are reported from what's gone on down there. It may well be that he satisfied them and they've satisfied themselves about spoiled papers, other matters of that nature. It may be that there won't be too many appeals tonight for a recount in order to save a deposit. At least we must hope not. And there is a very powerful group just awaiting the moment for the mayor's hour of glory and for the Bermondsey by-election to go into history, for the world to make of it tomorrow morning as it can. Now, just one thing, Mr. Kinnock. Uh, if there is a general election this year, what are you, as one of Labour's leaders, what are you going to do about Mr. Ken Livingston and the Greater London Council? And what are you going to do about their policies? You seem to have to uh, move in to stop them doing things in order to try to save seats. Well, the situation that you were talking about this week, a proposition... The troops out. Yes, a proposition for a £50,000 expenditure on the troops out movement was only ever a proposition uh, that Ken Livingstone himself uh, had said a couple of days before it appears that he was going to vote against it because he didn't think it was an appropriate use of resources and that but for the by-election, though possibly not, even in other circumstances, 
so paranoid is the approach to Ken Livingstone as to have probably inflated it to the idea that it was already a signed, sealed and collected policy. And Mr course, Foote had to course, ring him himself, didn't never he? Was. Yeah. Yes, in the circumstance of the by-election, it was important to absolutely impress upon the public consciousness that this was not a policy, that it was not a proposition that Labour officially supported, and Mr Livingstone and others also made it clear that it was a proposition that they didn't support. But these are the times in which we live. Had there been any form of fair representation of what was actually procedurally occurring in the Greater London Council at the beginning of this week, nobody would have had to issue denials or orders or make phone calls or anything like that at all because the issue would have been described on its merits of this, of which they were few, and of the reasonable possibility of it getting passed, which was virtually nil. But Mr. Freud, it was your, Mrs. Williams, your friend and ally, who floated this idea and said that this was what the GLC was going to do. Well, to put it another way, Mr. Livingston is a great embarrassment to the Labour Party, just as Mr. Tapton is, and I'm afraid Mr. Foote is going to become. Uh, there's no one who embarrasses a party more than its own members who feel differently or are more radical or even less radical. Um, I think Mr. Parkinson will surely agree that Mr. Livingston is a great asset the way he's just been stating that Mr. Foote is his chosen leader, because one would always wish um, the less efficient leaders of one's enemy's parties. Is that not so? Yes, I don't think, uh, I don't think Mr. Livingstone's a great advertisement for his ideas or for his uh, ability to run things. And I think that the way that uh, money is being squandered in London what, £7 million pounds plus this year is going to all sorts of highly unlikely groups because they've taken Mr Livingston's Gay fancy. civil servants yes, against the, the bomb. Yes, I think there's a fair amount of, of money, money being babies squandered. Babies against the bomb? I, I think it's being squandered by a government that would rather pay people not to work than use the same amounts of money in order to generate employment. I think that you are squandering an enormous amount of money. I think it's being squandered by a government that is cutting back on youth provision and on education and then trying to compensate by that by uh, awarding more money to an already pressurized police force. And I, I think there's a lot of money being wasted, but I think that uh, the sums being squandered by a conservative government as a consequence of breakdown of policies are vastly in excess no of any of expenditure policy, that Ken Livingstone yeah. even has access to, let alone spends. You uh, and your party went in for your free spending policies as a way of combating unemployment when you were last in government. You're spending Mr. more Foot than was we are because the minister in charge. He doubled that. Two and a half times unemployment went up. And what was more, in the pipeline was a, an inflation which was going to destroy no. hundreds of thousands of other jobs. No. Mrs. Williams, then one of your allies, now one of his, uh, actually... Uh, was a member of a committee which predicted two and a half million unemployed under you. It is sheer hypocrisy to pretend as you do that you have no responsibility for unemployment. If I may say so, Here's one the of hypocrisy. the problems your party has mm. is that the more you make that assertion, the more you damage your own no, credibility. No, not at all. I think, well, I tell you what, hypocrisy. there are many people from whom I take advice on credibility, but it wouldn't be the chairman of the Conservative <laughs> Party. I've got to inform you well, about that's your problem. When You've you got very about bad judgment. Hypocrisy. Do you remember Labour isn't working? That was yep. two million unemployed ago, you know. Do you remember that? No, I remember and, very well. and if you talk you don't about think it was, public you? expenditure, you don't think Labour was working. Yes, I think well, you know very well unemployment, unemployment was coming was up, going up. And and inflation was rising. Else. The IMF had come else. in to run the economy. Since you appear to have only the most rudimentary understanding of <laughs> statistics, the difference between a rising unemployment was a very important you're going to be the same. I, I, the think, I think there's some action yes. down at Bermondsey. It looks as if the returning officer has satisfied himself and everyone else. He's shuffling his feet ever so slightly. This is the moment that uh, we've all waited for. There's always a few nerves. The constabulary are actually visible on the floor, so they may be expecting just a little bit of trouble. Uh, I understand that the rival supporters have been uh, rather separated, indeed almost corralled, uh, like uh, an operation at certain football matches. But this appears to be the moment with uh, slow deliberation, and we're sure utmost accuracy, the Bermondsey count appears to be approaching its end. 
Some of the candidates and their supporters and minders are, are coming up to the front. The, the mayor, the returning officer, just walked away a moment ago. But there is, if there is any stir of expectation there, Mr. Tatchell, if there's any stir of expectation, it is now coming at Bermondsey. Uh, Peter, is that your reading? Yes, I think we've got a declaration imminent, Alistair. As they say, the, um, the agents and representatives for the candidates have all been told, I think, what the result is. They've checked off the figures. There aren't going to be any recounts. And all we need now is for the Mayor of Southwark, Mike Geeta, to let us in on the detailed numbers. You can see there the candidates are up on the platform. The, uh, the mayor, the one there on the right of the picture with the chain round his neck, there in the middle is uh, Lord Such, the only one of the candidates who admits he's a loony. John O'Grady, the real Bermondsey Labour candidate. Peter Tatchell, the official Labour candidate, waiting to hear what is expected to be the worst for him. The Conservative candidate Robert Hughes in the middle, 31-year-old BBC video editor. And at the back there, the man who has won tonight, but we're simply waiting to know the scale of his win, Simon Hughes, the Liberal SDP Alliance candidate, talking to the Conservative candidate, his, uh, his namesake, uh, Robert Hughes. It may have been... Uh, a dirty campaign, a bizarre campaign, a campaign that will go into the history books for a lot of slanging, a lot of uh, bad language. But none of it's been evident tonight. I think we can only be moments away now. And uh, I hope you'll stay with us, Alistair, because... Is it just a certain natural modesty and reticence on the part of the mayor? Or does he actually think we've scooped his story by giving the result so much earlier in the year? Yeah, well, he's, he's a charming man. He's not one of uh, election superstars. And here is the declaration. The uh, chief press officer, or one of the press officers for Southwark Council, is about to introduce the mayor of Southwark. And from the look of it, Peter, then you would expect something like £2,000 in lost deposits going to the Chancellor of the Exchequer from that bunch? Yes, I think it'd be uh, a reasonable night for the Treasury. And here it's certainly is... the biggest group photograph we've had at a by-election. Yes, and uh, there's only one person there who'll be very happy. Are we ready? Looks to the left of him, looks to the right. And now he'll put some into their misery and others out. Press photographers coming up to the front of the, uh, just beneath the, the returning officer. Mr. Tatchell's name is the 15th on the batting order, and therefore the result won't be officially known until he's uh, read all the way down. Here he is. I am now able to announce the result of this by election. The votes cast for the candidates were as follows. Alan Roy Baker. United Democratic. 15. Esmond Lee Bevan. Systems designer. 8. Jane Birdwood. Independent Patriot. 69. Fran Eden. Revolutionary Communist. 38. Bill Giddens. Independent Labour. 50. Robert Golden. Communist. 50. George Bell Hanna. Ecology. 45. Robert Girth Hughes. Conservative. 1,631. Simon Henry Ward Hughes. Liberal SDP Alliance. 1,700. And seven, 17,017. 17,017. A huge vote. <laughs> Mark 
New Britain Party. 62. Michael Desmond Kuhlman, 62. And Carol King. National Labour. 25. John Healy O'Grady. Real Bermondsey Labour. 2,243. <laughs> James. Stephen Sneath, National Front, 426. Yeah. Lord David Edward Such, Looney, 97. Yeah. And it's Peter Tatchell next. Peter Tatchell. It's Peter Tatchell next. Peter Tatchell, the Labour 7, 7,698. A majority for the Liberal SDP alliance of 9,390. The last one now, David Wedgwood. 15. 15 for the free trade anti and candidate. And I therefore declare that Simon Henry Ward Hughes has been duly elected to serve as Member of Parliament for the Southwark Bermondsey constituency. And there is, there is tonight's sensational result at Bermondsey. Simon Hughes, Liberal SDP, 17,017. Peter Tatchell, Labour, 7,698. The Conservative candidate losing his deposit with 1,631. Real Labour, 2,243. A majority for the Liberal Alliance of 9,319. And here is Simon Hughes. Friends, fellow Liberals, Social Democratic allies and all of you. Simon says, we've done it together. Tonight, you, the people of Southwark and Bermondsey, have decided in the ballot box to storm Labour's citadel, and you've certainly succeeded. You've decided tonight, as Southwark and Bermondsey have done in the past, to make a little bit of history. You've decided tonight to elect me as your Member of Parliament and I accept that responsibility. May I say two things to you all at the beginning? They're important and I hope you'll listen. Some people, and not us, have been responsible for personal attacks on other candidates in this campaign. We have condemned those throughout. We have, taken, we have taken no part in them. We condemn them tonight. And it may be that the reward of those who make such attacks is manifest for all to see. I hope that everybody will learn the lesson that politics should be a good, clean fight, as we have always made it. Secondly, there may be some who say that tonight is a defeat for the Labour Party. Yeah. What is certain is this. It's a victory for the Liberal Party and for the Alliance. It's a victory... It's a victory in three ways. It's a victory for the Liberal Party, for my agent Peter Bray, for my local committee, for all our members in Southwark and Bermondsey, it's a victory for the London region of the Liberal Party and the National Party. I am proud to be the first Liberal MP in Bermondsey for 59 years since the Reverend Kedwood and in Southwark since Mr. Strauss in 1939. And I will discharge that responsibility in the way they would have wished. Secondly, it's a victory for the Alliance. The Alliance has shown that we now can beat the Labour Party, the Tories cannot. The Alliance has shown that we are the opposition to the Conservative Party at the next general election. The Alliance has shown that the people are ready to trust us and are ready for a new start. But above all, Tonight is a victory for the people of this borough, for you in your homes tonight in Southwark and Bermondsey, from Surrey Docks to Blackfriars. 
It's your decision. You have decided. We abide by your decision. And I am determined to reward you with a diligent and loyal service. To be an energetic member of parliament seeking to serve your interests. To be a member of parliament who will try as hard as he can with the team around me to be of service to the community. And to work with you, to work with you for four things. For jobs to come back to our borough. For our borough to be a place where politicians gain respect. For somebody to keep a watch on the council and to protect and defend the interests of the citizens of this borough when the council ignores them or feels that they're left out. And then this, to carry on the liberal fight throughout the ages for the underprivileged, the under unemployed, the handicapped and the old, and also for the young. For their future, I am proud to be your Member of Parliament. We have a future together. And last, and last this, I thank you for electing me. I thank the returning officer for you, sir, with your staff, for the presiding officers, for the poll clerks, for the police, for the school keepers, and for all who have shown that democracy is alive and well and who work and will work to preserve it. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you above all to you, the people of this borough. We're going to go forward together. Thank you very much. The victorious Liberal SDP Alliance candidate Simon Hughes. And now it will be the turn of the defeated Peter Tatchell, the official Labour candidate. I'd like to thank the returning officer. He's seen an 11,700 Labour majority turned into a 9,319 like SDP, or rather Liberal SDP like Alliance majority. My aide, David Fryer, my aide Mary Honeyball, and Press Officer Monica Foote, and to the many, many Labour Party members, both in Bermondsey and from elsewhere, who came and helped and fought in our campaign for Labour. I'd also like to thank the police for their protection following the threats against me over the last few weeks. But most of all, I want to thank the people of Bermondsey who voted Labour in spite of the most unprecedented campaign of lies and smears by the press and by the opposition parties. I think it's an enormous tribute to the tolerance and compassion of those people who voted Labour that they stuck out against prejudice and bigotry in this election. And although we lost in this election today, I'm proud to say the Labour Party lost with honour. Unlike other parties, we fought our campaign on policies, on socialist policies, not on smears and not on personal abuse. In 1923, our Labour MP, Dr Salter, he lost Bermondsey, but he won it back in 1924. And likewise, we're going to win Bermondsey back for Labour at the general election later this year. <laughs> Finally, I want to conclude with a message to the working class people and Labour movement everywhere. Don't mourn this loss. Organise for a Labour victory at the general election to follow. We've lost a battle, but we haven't lost the war. Tonight in Bermondsey, a Labour victory has been delayed, but it cannot be denied. Thank you. Now, I think we can take a detailed look at tonight's result on our VTAT computer. Simon Hughes, Liberal SDP Alliance, 17,017. Peter Tatchell, Labour, 7,698. John O'Grady, Real Bermondsey Labour, 2,240. Three, he lost his deposit. 
Robert Hughes, Conservative, 1,631, also losing his depo deposit. A majority of 9,319, compared with the Labour majority at the last general election of 11,756. A turnout of 58%, a swing of 44.2% from Labour to the Liberal SDP. Distorted, of course, that swing figure, practically meaningless, because of the Labour vote being split between the official Labour and the real Bermondsey Labour candidate. The other candidates, can we see them? James Sneath, National Front, 426, all losing their deposits. David Such, 97, Dowager Lady Birdwood, 69, Michael Kuhlemans, 62, Robert Gordon, 50, Bill Giddings, 50, and the last page, George Hanna, Ecology, 45, Fan Eden, Revolutionary Communist, 38, and King, uh, National Labour, 25, David Wedgwood, uh, Free Trade, Anti-Common Market, 15, Alan Baker, uh, he was the United Democratic candidate, 15, and Esmond Bevan, 8. Esmond Bevan uh, coming within three votes of the world all-time lowest uh, total for uh, an election in Britain of five votes, the record still held by Commander Bill Bokes. Just look at the top again, can we? Just to remind you, 17,017 for the Liberal SDP candidate Simon Hughes, uh, a majority of 9,319. Let's look at the share of the poll each candidate took. Liberal Alliance took 58% of the poll. At, Cro at Crosby, they took 49.1%, so that is really their most smashing victory yet in terms of the share of the vote, the figures that really matter. Labour, 26%, uh, Real Bermondsey Labour, 8%, so they uh, had an absolute majority over, the, uh, over all other candidates. Um, and, of course, uh, if you add the Labour and the Real Bermondsey Labour votes together, they don't, still don't come anywhere near that Liberal total. Conservative, 5%, others, 3%. Compared with 1979, that's the difference. Real Bermondsey Labour, the distorting factor, of course, there, because they weren't there in 1979. Let's look at the change in the share of the vote since 1979. Liberal plus 50.9%. In 1979, they got 6.8%, 6 and that's now up 50.9%. Uh, Labour down 37.5%. Real Bermondsey Labour up 7.6%. Well, that's the, 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 uh, the, the sum total of their votes, because, of course, they weren't there last time. Conservatives down 19.4%, and others down 1.6%. And playing war games, if that result were repeated at a general election under the new boundaries in which the House of Commons would have six, 650 seats, well, we, we haven't worked that out. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult sum. I'm sure that uh, we could uh, find out for you a figure uh, sometime uh, tomorrow, but uh, it's uh, defeating our computer at the moment. There's the picture, a smashing a smashing a liberal uh, victory um, in alliance with the SDP at Bermondsey to remind you again that Labour majority in one of the Britain's safest seats of 11,756 at the last general election being turned into a majority of 9,319 for the alliance tonight. Glyn Mathias is down there, I think, with the victorious yes, candidate. Congratulations on your victory. You have Streaming Lords Trust just behind you, but if I can ask you about your, your victory, what's your reaction now? Well, we're delighted. It's bigger than we ever thought, Glyn, and it proves that the people of Bermondsey have not just decided to reject Labour, they have come over to us in droves, and people in Southwark and Bermondsey obviously wanted us to win, and they've made sure of it. But you must have been surprised at the 9,000 majority. That certainly was more than my estimate. I'm a modest man, and yesterday I put it down at 1,750. Uh, and how do you account for a majority much bigger than even you expected? People wanted us to win, and when they saw we could do it, they wanted to make sure we did it. The bandwagon gathered momentum, and it was quite clear that from yesterday it was coming our way in, in an enormous way. Now, can you really hold this seat at a general election? I haven't checked the figures, but I think that I have the largest Liberal majority in the country. I think I've had the largest swing in any parliamentary election this century. Again, I haven't checked. I think we can hold it with a little bit to spare, at least. But won't you, uh, won't you be in risk of disappearing in a general election? You won't have had the attention that you've had in this by-election. We've had the attention. I shall make sure as MP, if I can possibly do so, that I give the people a very good service. 
I rely on them to judge me next time, and I hope and trust that they'll re-elect me as they've re-elected good MPs in the past. And what is the significance of this uh, result here tonight for national politics? I think it's got a double significance. It shows that in the inner city, liberalism is alive and well, can win, and that no seat and need not be won by liberals in the future. For the alliance, it shows that we're the opposition for the next general election to the Tory government. Simon Hughes, thank you very much. And now back to Alistair Burnett. Thank you, Glenn. Neil Kinnock, a swing of 44.2% against Labour. Yes. I remember others of similar dimension, possibly not as big. I think we all recognise the unique nature, bizarre nature, I think Peter Sissons uh, called it, uh, grotesque, others might call it, of this particular election. And uh, I think that uh, Mr. Hughes summed up the last few days very well, that once people got the idea that a change could be made, they were determined to see it would be carried through. That is in the nature of the last-minute tumble of by-elections. Uh, but I think that the situation will be reversed come the election for an assortment of reasons. Bermondsey will be Labour again. Mr. Hughes will have a short sojourn in this particular seat, though, Seems a promising young lad. I'm sure he can go on around to other places. Mr Parkinson, Mr Jim Mortimer, who is the General Secretary of the Labour Party, says it's all the enemies of Labour who are jubilant. It's been a personal campaign of smears, slurs and slanders conducted against our candidate. The worst ever smear campaign against a candidate. And your candidate lost his deposit. Yes, and uh, our candidate lost his deposit, but he took no part in that. And there is nowhere on any record anywhere, any record of Bob Hughes descending to that sort of level. And may I just say I congratulate uh, the Liberals. I think it is a, a very, very, um, it's a stupendous victory. But uh, I would point out, and I agree with Neil here, it is a bizarre set of circumstances when you have the party which should have walked that election with two candidates spending the whole of their time proving that the other was unsuitable to represent the borough. So I think it's a very, very strange by-election, but I congratulate the winner. And Mr Freud, you are the victor tonight. Yes, and Simon Hughes will stay. Um, I think it's a, it's a bad result for Labour. It's obviously a marvellous result for us. Um, it's got to be admitted that it is a disastrous result for the government. Because the government, or the Conservative Party, had 7,582 votes in, this, in the general election in 1979. And less than four years later, they have one-fifth of that total. So they've lost about 80% of their support. And they are the government. And they are telling the nation that they have the message. And Mr Parkinson's been telling us that the Conservatives have the answers. And I think we know that they haven't, and it is good to see that the people of Southwark and Bermondsey have got that same message. Um, obviously, it's a marvellous result for us, and I must say, I totally disagree with the temporary nature of Simon Hughes' rise to Parliament. Do, he will stay. Well, it's the man actually sitting on your left who will help the Prime Minister decide when the general election is going to be called, which may in fact bring Mr Kinnock's prophecy into play or not. But Mr Kinnock, Mr Roy Jenkins has said tonight it's the end of the Labour Party as a party of government. Uh, that's, that's a I good mean, smile. You've the, had it on all night. No, that's... Uh, well, it, there have been several amusing things. These are amusing people to be with. It, it hasn't been a bad evening one way or another. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Jenkins says that repetitively, doesn't he? And he, indeed, uh, has a great deal in common with Mr. Hughes. I was up in Glasgow last week, and I think that uh, Mr. Jenkins will be collecting his redundancy pay um, from Parliament as well as from the EEC come the next general election. Thank you all very much. Well, this has been the night of the Bermondsey by-election. I think we've all lived through many by-elections with surprises, Upsets, worries and troubles. We've lived through Edge Hill, a Liberal victory against Labour. We've lived through Orpington, a Liberal victory against the Conservatives. We've lived through Ashfield, which was a Conservative victory against Labour. And we have also, although not quite so much in recent years, Northfield, of course, was a marginal seat, through Labour victories over the Tories. I think it's probably true that not just in statistics, the night of Bermondsey will be remembered. And I imagine not least by those who have laboured in this studio tonight. Thank you very much.
Good night. Very good. Thanks. That, that, that went well. Thank you.